You're listening to Well, I Laughed, Out and About, Part 1, Never Married. They're all drop shipped. <laughs> From Alibaba. Or somewhere, yeah. Hello. Okay, now we're good. Oh, wow, that's a cool little sound wave that you made. Hello. Hello. What is that? Why is it in between two bars? Hello. Is that how it always is? Uh, one is the decibels. One is uh, zero decibels. Yes, it's always like that. Okay. <laughs> um, At least that's what it's like when I edit it, so maybe I just don't notice. The depths of things that I do not know. <laughs> There's a comedy skit special that I want to show you. It's called hot and, or sweet and juicy or something okay. uh, and it's by shang wang and there's like i used to walk into a bookstore and be like just like struck with awe with mm. like look at all these things i am gonna learn <laughs> and now it's like i walk into a bookstore and i'm like look at all these things i'm never gonna uh-huh. know of all the things i don't know these are daryl's favorites <laughs> I walk into a bookstore and my first thought is, oh, okay, okay, there's a lot of dust in here. Um, that's okay, no, that's fine. It, it's okay. Do you have any gay books? No? Okay, thanks. <laughs> End of scene. Thank you so much. You and I are vastly different people. <laughs> I walk into a bookstore and say, yes, I live here now. <laughs> my mailing address is here. <laughs> no, I do, I do love a bookstore. I just feel like mainstream bookstores don't carry the kind of stuff that I want to read, and so I have to go to like old, gay like bookstores. secondhand bookstores. Yeah, or like, yes. Um, Literal gay bookstores. And you're like, oh, okay, so there, there are mice that live here, and that's fine. I'm a tad allergic, but that's fine. <laughs> oh, poor baby. Thank you. Thank you. Aww. I'm allergic to the air, Maya. I'm allergic to the air. <laughs> Have you seen that girl on TikTok that's literally allergic to water? What? Yeah. Her, like, like you are to the ocean or like legitimately water? No, like legitimately water. allergic. How, does she, how? She's like, she's made her like, her like fame on TikTok by like being like, a day with me is allergic to water. She's like, has like a lot of chronic conditions and spends a lot of time in the hospital and she like struggles to like, she like has to do special stuff to like take showers and everything. Yeah, I could imagine. Yeah. I want to say it's chronic, chronically ill court or something, but I, that might be a different. How does she stay person. hydrated? Uh, I couldn't tell you. Like an IV? I don't remember. I did do this deep dive at one point because I was like, okay. what the hell do you mean? You're allergic to water? If only we had a podcast that let us figure these things out. I don't know. <laughs> How was your work day? Oh, that thing. Uh, That's what I said. And then you said there's a pop-up thing. And then my brain said thing. Oh, nice. I think, okay. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, work was fine. Work was good. We had a yeah. quiz day today. So that was um, fairly easy. Um, I don't know. I just feel like I've talked so much about work the last couple of episodes, especially. That's Probably and I'm true. still loving it, but I just, there's nothing new going on right now. Everyone is absolutely ready for spring break, which makes them an absolute joy to be around. Oh. But I have a couple of life updates. I wrote them down so I wouldn't forget <laughs> That's them. <a> note <laughs> um, I have a couple of things that I want to share. First, mm-hmm. our friend Tyler, our dear friend Tyler, is now trying to walk the line early on, friends, if you're like, Tyler, why do you guys keep talking about Tyler? Yeah. Early on when no one was listening, the joke yeah. was to see how long it would take before Tyler yeah. listened. And now he like kind of listens, but he doesn't listen, and it's unclear if he's listened to everything or he just skipped a bunch to get caught up to like the current era or whatnot. That's what he did, 100%. Probably, yes. probably. So we were making fun of him for that recently. Yeah. Um, and then he was over at my house for like a little sleepover because he lives up in Boulder and he had something happening in my neighborhood. And I exposed him to Modern Family for the first time. Oh, and he told you that you were the one character that I don't know their names. All I know is that you're... (laughs) He does think I'm a lot like Cam. Yes, which again, that's fine. Fine, It was just, I was like, do you want to watch Modern Family? And he was like, I truly do not care. And then I was like, are you sure? He goes, I have no opinion on it at all whatsoever. And then we started watching Modern Family and he was doing something and he just like, like, you know, that thing where you're like, have the phone in your hand. Pretend to not watch and then watch. Right. And And then they're just kind of watching the entire time and he's starting to ask me about it. And I was like, (laughs) and at one point we're listening to one of the episodes and he was like 
there's a lot going on at this episode. And I go, yeah, there's an A plot, B plot, and a C it's a plot. It's sitcom, babes. Right, exactly, exactly. Um, so I got a chance to expose Tyler to Modern Family, which is wonderful. That's fun. And then in our little Modern Family watching marathon, um, he told me about one of our dear friends that's in our social circle who's a lesbian. Oh, okay. And uh, just a little update on what her life is. She's recently seen a new partner, Ooh. and that's exciting. And she's storing her her partner's and her partner's sister's motorcycles in her garage right now. Sometimes I'm like, do, am I am I not bi? Am I secretly just gay? And then I and then I hang out with some lesbians, and I'm like, no, I am absolutely not. They're also just playing with the idea of getting a dog together. It's, I love her a lot. She is kind of the definition of a U-Haul lesbian. Oh, okay, so I, I think I'm getting to that stage now where we all just kind of really settle into the comfortability of who we are. Right. And a lot of my friends who are lesbians are starting to show some of those real stereotypical tendencies of things. I yeah. have a friend, different lesbian friend, who's moved at least one woman in and out of her house oh already. Gosh. And I've, I've like, haven't introduced anyone to my family ever before, <laughs> you know? <laughs> We all have a role to play. Anyways, I just thought that was fun. Wish them the best. They seem happy. And then the last update I have from our little Tyler hangout. Uh-huh. We watched the trailer for Kung Fu Panda. Oh, yeah. And he was like, oh, my gosh. Like, he's such a cool actor. And I go, I know he is. He goes, uh, yeah, like, oh, no. I just love Guy Fieri. <laughs> Shut the fuck up. You couldn't be more wrong, but also simultaneously <laughs> so right. Oh, so right. no. I know. I thought that was, I was like, okay, well, that's, I, as soon as I started to write that down, I was like, actually, lesbians, <laughs> modern family, like, that was the birth of that little notes app on my phone. Um, and so that was fun. So uh, Tyler and I had a little sleepover uh, the other night, which is fun. Yeah. You can still have sleepovers as adults when you're friends. As you should. And if you have a partner, they can sleep in the guest. Room. Right, exactly. As in your partner sleeps in the guest room. Liddy was jealous. She couldn't attend, but of course they were skiing in the mountains. Oh, so, no. I know, I know. <laughs> um, so that's it. I have one more little update. Totally not Tyler related, though. So Good. I'm going to ban- uh, volley it uh, back over to you. How's oh. life? What's going on? What's what's know. things? Things are f- fine. I don't, I don't know. Today went by in a blur. I got hyper fixated on something at about 9.30. I think, uh, and then suddenly it was 11, and then Mm. I was like, that's weird, and then suddenly it was 3, and then it was (laughs) 5, and I was like, what the fuck, I had things to get done that were not this today, and then at like 5.15 I got a message from my boss, like, asking about a different thing, and I was like, ah, ha, 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 ha. Get that to you tomorrow afternoon. (laughs) He was like, so that other thing you're working on is, like, full time, yeah? And I was like, oh, No, I just got really into it. (laughs) It it was a full Monday. (laughs) I don't know what else to tell you. Yeah, so I was, I took the, I was gonna go for a run today, and then I realized I hadn't eaten because I'd gotten hyper fixated Mm. all day. And then I was like, maybe I shouldn't do that. And so I went for a walk with Casey, and it just felt like I was going on a morning walk. And it was what time? It was five. Great, okay, cool, Because sweet. I just sat down and just like <laughs> zoned in for literally eight hours, and I have not done that in a while, so I just feel very strange. I'm never here to judge you for that. That tendency of yours is why the podcast exists, so yeah. I am grateful for it. At 5 p.m., I had gotten home from work, a little tired, that's fine, ate a little bit of dinner, took a 20-minute power nap, because I can do all things that restore me for about 10 to 15 minutes, just you a wanna, quick little rejuvenation. You want to tell the people why you took a power nap? Just because I'm tired. Because you... you, you nope, I do not want to tell them that. <laughs> I don't even want to tell Patreon that. <laughs> maybe, maybe we'll tell Patreon that. We're talking about... No, we're talking about Oh, we're not you. talking about no, that? No, I'm talking <laughs> I was like, Maya. <laughs> no, we're talking about how you... Because you texted me that you might be early, and then I did... <laughs> Why is that uh, what you're... I don't know, to? but I was like shocked. I was like, I don't. I really don't want to talk about I that. I would have never... I, that's why I was so surprised. Yeah, no, we can talk about yeah, that. Yeah, think your worst thought, dear listener. <laughs> yes, that is what he doesn't want to tell you. So I was like, I could get there early. Oh, I just texted and my didn't respond within 60 seconds. She must need a minute. Couch, blanket, blanket. Like just I was out. just cleaning and setting up, so it's fine. 
I still got here at like 6.45. Oh, yeah, you got still got here early. early. I, yeah, you got you. here around or like five minutes before that. I was like, not nah, Casey, guess what Grant said? <laughs> He'd be here early. <laughs> I know, because when you like that, I was already past Ball Arena. Yeah. Uh, I saw the little <laughs> notification pop up on my car screen, and I was like, boy, this is going to be really awkward if it's like, hey, sorry, just saw this, but I'm out walking the dogs right now. So <laughs> fortunately, I did check your location to make sure you weren't at uh, some like, crazy yeah. fitness regime again <laughs> before I started my journey downtown. The latest I'll be out at a fitness class is 6.15, so you're fine. Okay, that's good to know. Almost a year into this, it's like, oh, okay. That's oh, yeah, that's, your, that's your routine? No. Uh, I just feel like since we were talking about work, teachers, you can relate to this. In April and May... After spring break, everyone's kind of just pretending to teach, but everyone's kind of in on it together. Yeah. Students, administration, uh, teachers, right? Like there's field trips, there's state testing, mm-hmm. you know, we're mm-hmm. just kind of all baked in. And we're already talking about next school year. But right now is when you kind of want to pretend to be teaching, but not everyone's in on it yet, particularly ah. the students, where it's like, if you could just like chill for a second. Babe. <laughs> exactly. And I just told one kid today that they couldn't leave their assigned seat and go sit on the couch with their friends. And they're like, why? And I was like, I would love to have a hallway conversation with you so we can find a seat that's most successful for you. And then we go out to the hallway and she was like, okay. And I was like, Girl, you're like the fourth kid who asked to move their seat. If I let you move to sit next to your friends, like it's going to undo all of that Everything. work. So I will let you move somewhere else, but you specifically cannot sit on the couch with your friends. And she goes, Ugh. Honestly, I'd just rather stay where I'm at then. And I was like, good solution! Yay! And then I was like, I win. And you got to count the small ones sometimes. <laughs> it's fine. It was Monday. Um, and then speaking of teaching, last little life update I think I have. Mm-hmm. Um... This goes out to my friend who is a speech coach out in California. I'm realizing right at the second I have actually not asked for permission to use your name, so I won't. But one of my friends is a coach out in California, and we actually competed on the same team in Mm. high school together, which is very cool. And I heard recently that she hosted her first tournament, and she was like, honestly... All the stressing you did on the podcast had me feeling really prepared because I just kept listening to what you were worried about. And so I felt really prepared going into my first tournament. And I was like, oh, that's so good to hear. I love that. You know, so my anxiety it's helping people. helped others. Wow. Sounds like it went really well. That's so crazy. sending you podcast love yeah. from Denver right now. Um, I had a coworker text me <laughs> randomly. Like last week or something. The they're not like they have social media, but they're not like really active on it. And they're out of a different office, so I've met them in person maybe like a handful of times. Sure. Otherwise, I worked with them quite a bit like a year and a half ago. And now they're kind of we're kind of like don't talk as much. But he texted me and was like, "Wait, super random question. <laughs> Do you have a podcast? <laughs> <laughs> because I was watching TikToks with my wife, and your face came up. Hell yeah, brother! And so I was like." Ha ha, yeah. That's whole, he even was like, it's a podcast called Well I Laughed. And I was like, no, believe me, even if it wasn't mine, I would know what podcast right. I was on. <laughs> Only on one. Yeah, and I was like, yeah, no way. That's, that's uh, me and my friend's podcast. I was wondering when someone from work would finally find it. No response. Nice. I was like... My dude! There's group chats that you're being dropped in right now. Oh, just probably. So you know. That's just fine. Boom. I don't care. Yeah. Yeah. So now, uh, yeah, everything's fine. Um, I think some of my coworkers forget that I still work there because I come in every morning and I go like directly to my classroom ah. and then the children come to me <laughs> and then I do lunch duty on Mondays. Uh, but then other than that, just, I yes. it's my classroom, coffee, coffee pea printer, and then back to uh, my my classroom. And mm-hmm. then at 5 p.m. they're like, Thomas, I haven't seen you in like two months. How have you been? And I go, really good. I've been kind of hidden in the back corner of the school. Like, really good. And that's where I want to really be. Really good, exactly, exactly. <laughs> really good stuff. Um, so, yeah. Yeah yeah. yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. What else do I have? I don't know. I think that's it. I don't know what's going on. My day has been so strange. It's okay. It doesn't have to be anything special. Yeah. I ran five miles with Bowser. Hey, that's good. It's the longest I think I've ever run, like, consecutively. I did have to take a couple breaks because I was not feeling it. Sure. But, and Bowser was fine. I was expecting him to be really slow because the last couple runs we've done, he's been, like, it's been, like, a reverse sled dog situation. (laughs) (laughs) Towards the end. He's Um, not built for speed. Are we about to make this a running podcast again? Like, we in the early summer or late summer? Yeah. I uh, I did three miles yesterday, and Mm -hmm. that was good because I am being reminded of myself. Like, the big obstacle 
is that like initial barrier when your body is like, I'm tired of running. I don't want the. And if you just run through that, everything's then fine. you're fine after mm-hmm. that, kind of really for the most part. And so Edgar, I was like, Ugh. I got drinks with Edgar and Kelsey this past weekend. <laughs> Kelsey was like, or I don't remember who started it, but Edgar was like, sorry if I'm like checking in on you guys a lot. <laughs> and I was like, you checked in with us twice. twice for the and thing Kelsey, that we're doing together. Yeah, and Kelsey was like, it feels like a lot for me because I'm in, <laughs> I'm in all of the group chats and also not training for that <laughs> marathon. I think you're not training for that marathon. <laughs> Forgive me if I'm incorrect. But uh, I was like, that's fair. That's super fair. Um, I tend to not value the opinion of my students unless, mm-hmm. of course, it's a compliment for me. <laughs> and uh, we returned from state and my assistant coach got into the building but didn't realize the alarm was already activated and then didn't know how to disarm the alarm. Ah! And I do. So, yeah. but the, my assistant coach was like, Thomas, I need your help right away. So I like dropped my work bag and sprint because the alarm means the EPS is calling uh, the police department uh, to go investigate uh-huh. the robbery that's happening. And yeah. so I like sprint, I deactivate the code then I go back to the front door and I'm like come on in kids like building's open now so if you need to use the restroom that's fine and I heard one kid look uh, to another one of my students and goes yo Loki Thomas is like kind of athletic and I was just like thank you so much the gym is right there <laughs> yes <laughs> um, so yeah the problem that's is fun. I think we are now seeing each other so regularly it's like you know cause you were there oh one more do we want to tell them what we did on Friday you sure? Uh, so we had a little small little get together on Friday, mm-hmm. and then we went downtown. So fun! Haven't done that in forever. I feel like I'm coming back to life. I feel like I'm a little social gremlin that has like come out of like my little cage or whatever. I'm like, let's party for the next six months. Let's have fun. Let's see people. I want to be super clear. I did not want to go out. <laughs> <laughs> like, I wanted to come out for some pre drinks, and then Tyler told me that he would drive me home. <laughs> next thing I know, someone had paid for my entrance to the bar and also my first drink. And we're like, Maya, Maya. Come to meet Danny's new boy for and a I second. And I was like, why am I in here? <laughs> So I, didn't, anyways, I didn't even put my contacts in. I was effectively in pajamas in this bar. Okay, but it's Maya, so it's like hot pajamas. It's like these tie-dye short shorts yeah. kind of things well, and then a crop were, top. Like sweat shorts and like a cro- like my F45 crop top. I, I, When you see me and I'm going out, you're like, that girl's going out. That was me like, she might have wandered in here on accident. Did that girl lose the dog she was taking out <laughs> to use the bathroom? When, there was a guy that was shell- selling a uh, gel. Jello shots. shots and I was just, I was just like sitting there like texting Casey I think and he was like are you here by yourself <laughs> and if you've never been to a gay bar it's so community oriented but they'll ask they'll <laughs> ask and also he's wearing next to nothing right, exactly. and so I'm just like haha no <laughs> when Angel Wings is like oh honey do you know where you're supposed yeah. to be <laughs> are you did here? you get left are you on purpose <laughs> I was like damn it Grant <laughs> We invited you to dance with us. I did come um, out for like a second, and then miraculously, a second drink was bought. Which you said yes to. I pointed to you and asked, and you said yes to it. I'm pretty sure what I did was, eh. And I was like, that'll be three. <laughs> what I did was look at my still half full drink and say like, maybe. And then I gave a said half full drink to Tyler, who then did not drink it. No, absolutely not. No. Um, I just love it because it's this is now a City Girl podcast for half a second. <sighs> you leave, not early, but I, I mean, it. certainly later than what you were expecting. But yes. you leave before the rest of us do. I left, I was home around midnight. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you were there for like 45 minutes or so. We left probably an hour after you did yeah. and went to the exact same Euro place There's across a, the street. Once, If you go to Charlie in Denver, yeah. there's a Euro place, Euros with a Z. Euros drive through And they're but open. You can also walk in. Yeah, they're, <laughs> they're open exactly half an hour past when Charlie, they know their clientele. Let me tell you. No, 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 no. No. They close in a half an hour before Charlie's closes. Are you because serious? Because they know when Charlie's close, the people that are coming out of that, they're messy. <laughs> they don't want to deal with that. I have legitimately... I've seen them close the doors on people. I always right. just thought they closed no, after the door it's closed. it's like 1.45. Oh, that's 140. hilarious. And I have seen friend groups get like titanic lifeboat before, <laughs> right? Yeah, Where I like the door that. gets closed and like two of them are in there and then the ones that were the stragglers plus the friend that was watching after the stragglers. Get me a falafel, exactly. yo! They're like, oh, it's locked. And the cashier guy's like, yeah. And they're like, <laughs> and they're like, <laughs> and so yeah, now they're trying to like yell through and you end up having to walk through like the service exit to like get out. 
I love that place. Anyways, I do love we that were there. Place. We picked up euros from the intimate at my house, and you're just never you're never too young or too old just to have a little bit of euros with your friends on your kitchen table at two a.m. Technically Saturday morning. <laughs> See. If I could just skip to that part of the evening, I would. It's just everything in between. Okay, at the start, listen, the, the Oreo of this cookie, that's the top cookie. Yeah. The bottom cookie was when you were eating onion rings uh, on my couch <laughs> before we went out. Yeah, that's fair. I had a good time. Don't put chips in your home if you don't want me to eat them. I don't care what they cost. I wasn't going to talk about the embezzlement. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm um, just going to make Tyler pay for them. That's fine. <laughs> that is uh, something that I will save for Patreon because we have to talk about something yeah, when it comes fair. to Patreon. Yes. So um, are you ready for tonight's story? No. Truthfully, kind of sane. No. <laughs> because this format of the story is so different than anything I've really kind of done in the past. Um, I don't know what that means. Right. So the theme is... Oh, out and about. Right, out and about. Which, when I asked Tyler what he thought I was going to do with that theme, guessed it right away. Are you serious? Yeah, so what do you think I'm about to I talk to no you about I have no fucking that? idea. Beautiful, okay? I'm about to basically do a History's Mysteries episode on gay history. Okay. <laughs> what did Tyler guess? Um. Oh, wait, you were going to do like, like, some gay history, history thing? Oh, and okay. I was like, I mean... I mean, it's it's bigger than that, Tyler. <laughs> <laughs> okay, out and about. Okay, right, I get kind of it. more like not out, but definitely about, and then eventually out, out and, and about. about. Okay, yes. that makes sense. Oh, that doesn't help me at all for picking my story because I was like, maybe I'll just see what Grant's doing and that'll give me an idea. Nope, <laughs> well, <laughs> certainly we're, uh, not. We're kind of back up to like a regularly like episode yes. cushion, so we have a minute. We can we can think about it. We yeah. can brainstorm. We don't at need the to end. record until next week. Actually, this time. Wow, so. that is actually really I know, exciting. That's insane. Because that anxiety has hung over our head like an axe I know, for like forever. the entire year. Yeah. <laughs> we haven't gotten our shit together. So this story is hard to figure out where to start. So I'm going to give you like the headline of what I was trying to explore when I started the process of pulling this all together. And then you'll kind of understand why it was so hard to discuss in the first place. I've been doing a lot of history episodes the last couple ones, kind of been in a root. I'm looking to get out of that, so I'm like, we'll do one last one. And I've been looking to try to get back into kind of like people bios, right? Like, here's mm-hmm. this really interesting person. Let's talk about their life and legacy, stuff like that. Those are the episodes I think I usually end up enjoying the most. Yeah. And I was like, oh, like, I know, like, let's do like a famous gay historical person or yeah. whatever and kind of pull them apart. But the issue with that is that... Um, much of the, like, potentially gay history that we have today Mm. comes with justifiable reasons as to why it's not gay, Ah. and that is why it's been allowed to survive for so long. Right. So, in a degree, we're going to talk about famous, potentially, probably, definitely, historical gay people. We're also going to talk about the process of, like coming out and what it meant to come out and how that has developed over time and like we're just gonna kind of we're just gonna talk about gay history for the next 20 minutes to two hours whatever you would like okay do you want to name one historical gay person you can't say my name (laughs) (laughs) you can talk to a brick wall for the rest of this episode listen i can talk to a brick wall every day of my life i can talk to a brick wall i can fall asleep whenever Wow, I hate you so much. <laughs> Jesus. So here's where I decided to officially start this story. Mm-hmm. The big issue with a lot of gay history is that none of the characters you end up studying ever really came out, you know? Ah, uh, so it's least, all like hypothetical. Exactly. It was all like, never married. Lived with his best friend for 75 years. When he'd passed, he left his extensive doily collection <laughs> to his niece. Right? Like, that, But that's as much of like an airtight case yeah. as you yeah. get. So I decided to start off this story by first investigating where we get the phrase coming out. And mm-hmm. this is now also my chance to share where I got all my sources from. Nice. Um, this history mystery, not a mystery in this department. Hey. We get things from the UCLA press, the uh, NYU press. We get things from This American Experience, from the Human Rights Campaign, from Gleason, from, of course, Wikipedia, from a Netflix documentary, which is on page five, whose name I have completely forgotten. We'll get to um, it when we get to it. Uh, there's, there's honestly so many links. Um, 
and I'll have to put them all on the website and hyperlink them all individually. You can just kind of copy and save them because they're all all at the bottom of the document. I know. Oh, okay. So let's get into it. (laughs) I know how you structure your notes by now. I've had to look several times. (laughs) I am uh, not changing, so that's really good to hear. Okay, so uh, what is the history of the phrase coming out? In the late 19th and early 20th century, gay subculture thrived in many large American cities. Gay men spoke of coming out into gay society, intentionally borrowing the term from debutante society, where young women would come out into society for the oh, first okay. time. Makes sense. Like a debutante yeah. ball, things like that. Yeah. Um, a 1931 news article from a Baltimore Afro American newspaper referred to, quote, the coming out of the new debutantes into homosexual society. It was titled 1931 Debutantes Bow at Local Pansy Ball. <laughs> that was a direct, nice. direct quote from the American experience. Nice. And also some of this was borrowed from the American Smithsonian Museum. Nice. So we're borrowing the term directly from the debutante culture there- to come out. A non-American Smithsonian? It's like the American uh, Smithsonian Museum. I'm trying to say the American History Smithsonian okay, Museum. I was like... No, because okay. then there's also like the natural history yeah, yeah, and yeah. stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So um, at this time, coming out does not mean like, Mom, <laughs> Dad. Dad, I have something to tell you. And I promise it's not going to change anything about me, right? In this time period, coming out is talking about how you are entering this subculture. It's like this the like, dad and mom being like, our daughter is ready for marriage. Exa- <laughs> yes, exactly. Do you see my daughter? She is 15. Perfect for a weird marriage to a 30 She comes with 15 cows. Exactly. <laughs> Do you see that pink lace? <laughs> yes. You know what that means. <laughs> we had pink lace. <laughs> <laughs> we had pink one of my favorite parts about Greta Gerwig's Little Women mm-hmm. is when I forget what her actual name is. The one that ends up marrying the school teacher. Do not remember any of their that names. March sister yes. uh, goes to a debutante ball mm-hmm. and just kind of fully pretends she's one of them for a little bit. But I don't think ends up really enjoying it. Yeah. Either that or Timothy Chalamet ruins it. I think both mm. are valid experiences. Yes. Um, <laughs> but yes, okay, it's about coming out into this subculture. So mm-hmm. you're still keeping your like public life very much heterosexual facing. But now you are attending the events, you like are starting to develop a, a network of, mm-hmm. you know, fellow male debutantes who have come out into society. Did you ever go to a debutante ball? No. No. Oh. You know who has? Twice? Mm-hmm. Casey. Yep. <laughs> For a second, I was like, why would your immigrant mother put you in a debutante ball? But I was like, oh, no, nope. a little Southern Belle upstairs. <laughs> Southern Belle. <laughs> also, I was, when I was in Western Airs, the like, horseback riding organization that I did, um, when we were seniors, we all went to this like ball at the end, or not ball, but like little dance dinner thing called um, Boots and Stockings. Boots and stockings, something like that. Uh, <laughs> but we all had to like learn what it was, what the etiquette of like being presented mm. at a ball. And there, of course, there's like five men total, and so they would have to cycle through to take us all into the ball. Just imagine there's like a chair for them yeah. to like, get some water. Yeah, like, like, oh god. Like <laughs> yeah, and we had to learn like which which like silverware to use and like the plates and stuff. And one of the girls in my class was a debutante, and sure. her her mom came in to teach the class to all of us. And it was so funny because it would happen after we all got done riding. So we're all covered. We all, our uniforms were white for some Good. godforsaken that makes reason. Sense. Yeah. Messing with dirt. Good. Yeah. And so we're all covered in mud. We're all dusty. Like, no one looks cute. And they, like, don't even trust us with real silverware. They just have a piece of paper <laughs> with, like, the drawing of where a plate should be. And then they were, like, walking us through everything. And I was like, what? Is Out the point? To yeah, Out that's to it. End. And the top is the dessert. That's uh-huh. all you gotta know. And now you fold your <laughs> napkin. There is this pretty infamous story that my mom enrolled my sister in etiquette classes oh, when she funny. was a child to like learn how to like sit proper in a chair and things. It's extra funny because, and mom, I love you, but like we were, especially at that time, solidly middle class family. Yeah. What? What high teas in Lincoln, Nebraska, did we need to make sure we were properly trained for in that moment? It was funny because I it never occurred to my parents to teach me that kind of stuff, but it always came up because my entire extended family is on the East Coast. Right. And so it, it came up quite a bit when I 
became an adult and then I like went to a conference or something and I was like, this is what you do. And all my sorority sisters were like, what? <laughs> Why is your napkin folded like that? Get out. <laughs> <laughs> um, every now and then when we're traveling with the speech team and like mm-hmm. we go out to dinner because yeah. it's like nationals or something, right? Lydia and I will put like the, Na- the napkin, napkin on our there. lap yeah. and you'll see the kids like... <laughs> And then like, yeah, put, put it, it on, on yeah. their lap, and it's like, oh, <laughs> oh, you didn't know to do that. <laughs> well, no, but it was just like we're at a wing place. I think yeah. Lydia and I are doing it reflect, like reflexively yeah. at this point. I mean, it's a high school trip. It's yeah. not like we're going to a steakhouse by any means. It's also like it's very funny. I don't think I ever felt the need to put a napkin on my lap until <laughs> I don't know when. <laughs> Paragraph two. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have these uh, gay people. It's kind of specifically gay men. The next like. 20 minutes to an hour. The first part of this is going to be very focused on the gay male experience. Mm. Uh, And I am generally speaking about uh, cisgendered gay men in that experience too. There is a part later on where we talk about the different gendered experiences. So that's just me flagging it now and norming Mm -hmm. on some language. So, um, 1930s, 40s, and 50s witnesses two things. More and more people moving to the city, and then second, uh, a growing emergence of gay subculture, right? Mm -hmm. We're starting to come up with terms that we can use to describe ourselves. There's selective publishing companies that you can go to to read. You become aware of the coffee shop or the sandwich place or Mm -hmm. the photography business that, you know, is kind of like in the know a little bit, and you end up forming this little community. Much like how people do on online today and that one guy in bridgerton (laughs) exactly (laughs) i mean we're gay people in bridgerton because i don't know what straight man they think is watching that (laughs) but whatever um the madison society is one of the earliest organizations specifically around the homophile movement Mm. their words which was just basically like let's make gay people more acceptable to everybody oh and it took its name from a mysterious medieval figures in masks In this context, coming out meant acknowledging one's sexual orientation to oneself and other people. It did not mean revealing it to the world on like a big stage. Okay. And so coming out is this personal thing to connect you with your first boyfriend, your first ex-boyfriend, right? And all of the organizations that you're going to like end up running in. Uh, Such selective sharing relied on code phrases such as family, club member, a friend of Dorothy's, hey. episode like two. Yeah, uh, a friend of Mrs. King, or simply gay. That one Mrs. could. Mrs. King. I I don't actually even okay. know. I I was like I got all of them except that That's one. That's okay. Um, that could be used in mixed company to designate someone as a homosexual. Nice. A little wink, wink, and a nod. Still, by the way, a really fun game to play when you go to a cocktail party where you don't know that many people, right? Because you can't just be like, so how was your Last relationship, what was their name and pronouns, right? Like, that's not how <laughs> you can start off a conversation. So now it's like, okay, does this person dress well because they're gay or because they have a girlfriend? <laughs> Who cares about Let's how they look? Let's find out. <laughs> when we asked Edgar earlier today where oh he got God. his shirt from. Literally live and, and breaking he, news. he said, I don't know. <laughs> Or no, Kelsey responded and he said, I'm so thankful for my wife because I had no idea. Have you seen, so Caleb Hebron, the comedian, is on the Brittany Broski show. Sure. And they get someone who writes in about um, bisexual women or something Mm -hmm. like that. And Caleb Hebron goes, I have nothing but respect for bisexual women and their boyfriends. (laughs) As you should. (laughs) <laughs> Anyways, okay, so the community develops an in-language first, and after the Stonewall Riots, check out episode, I Eight. think, two. Yep. Um, after the Stonewall Riots, it starts to be publicly acknowledged as gay. That becomes the word that we use when speaking about our ourselves and our community to mm-hmm. other communities and organizations. And now that we had, like, a word that we could use to talk to other people about, and that word didn't necessarily mean shame Mm -hmm. for at least ourselves where did that word come from um that's a great question because it means happy technically yeah Yeah. oh here's your paragraph to answer that question excellent (laughs) 
I was like, uh, I did. There's a lot of pages to this, and so I was like, um, do we still have that? Yes. Um, and I want you to know, if I ever ask you a question, you're like, fuck, I don't know. I'll cut it if you want. Okay, cool, cool, cool. That's really not this time. I wish you did. <laughs> Listen, that means I've been able to answer basically every question she's had up That's to this true. point. That's true. It's true. And I can answer this one, too. Yeah. The term gay was originally borrowed from a slang for women prostitutes. Nice. Uh, when they used what? the word to defer to women in their profession. Of course, gay was ultimately outed when the gay rights movement adopted it following the Stonewall Rebellion. Hmm. Coming out took on a more political meaning after the 1969 Stonewall Rebellion, in which patrons of the Stonewall Inn in New York City fought back against a police raid. For those of you who don't have the time to go back 44 episodes and re-listen to the episode two. The mafia used to run the gay bars. That was actually such a funny episode. It's a good episode. It's a good episode. It's a short one, too. Um, so that results in the first, like the outward use of the word gay and the first gay rights march hmm. that then helps breed kind of a gay rights political movement in the 1970s. Here's my next pop quiz question for you, Maya. I'm not going to know the answer. You actually might. Who was the first openly gay oh. elected official in the United States? As soon as you say it, I'm going to know. Harvey Milk. You're yes. right. Yeah. yeah. Out of San Francisco. There this is a weird history there, too. I'll get to that in a second. Mm -hmm. But Harvey Milk is uh, an openly gay elected city council member. They're called supervisors mm -hmm. in the city of San Francisco. And one of the big rallying cries he has in the 1970s is he's begging gay people to come out to like the reason why there's so many anti-gay laws is because we hide ourselves and then misinformation is then much easier to perpetrate, right? Mm -hmm. But like, it's hard to imagine gay people as like perverts or criminals or otherwise mischievous if you know them. Right. And they're like, oh, they go to my book club or they're in my community garden or we go to church together or that's who my uncle is or who my brother is, et cetera, that you need to come out. And so there becomes this big rallying cry to like come out and that kind of becomes this like big official uh, okay. push. That makes sense. I think also there's a certain degree of like gay people at this time would like move to the city and then mm -hmm. live this like big gay life, but like not tell anybody <laughs> back at home. And I think there's still a degree of truth to that too. But that is how the word coming out first meant coming out as a debutante to the gay community yeah. that makes this really cool journey. Like you're coming out into your community. Correct. Here, yeah. And then that like coming out as an important visibility marker for a community that has long been defined by shame. Oh, don't you worry. We got lots of that on for tonight. <laughs> but like no longer is. Yeah. Here's my fun trivia, also kind of sad, about Supervisor Harvey Milk. Okay. Supervisor Harvey Milk um, dies by assassination in 1978 mm -hmm. when a fellow city council member assassinates him, Dan White. Yikes. He assassinates Harvey Milk and San Francisco Mayor, Mayor Moscone. Okay. Two important things come out of that. First, Dan White's defense team argues that one of the reasons Dan White committed two murders at the city hall building is because his hormones were deregulated oh, because he was eating too much junk food in a defense known as the Twinkie defense. Good fucking bye. I know. What? Secondly, the uh, person in San Francisco government who announced the death of Supervisor Harvey Milk and Mayor Moscone, future U.S. Senator Dianne Feinstein. Oh, nice. <laughs> that was such a weird response. <laughs> <laughs> also, uh, the most recent acknowledgement of Harvey Milk that I've at least seen uh, was when... <laughs> ex-congressman George Santos claimed <laughs> that he knew him and clearly did not <laughs> I don't think Harvey Milk ever spent any time in Brazil in the 70s no I also don't I don't believe for a second George Santos even really understands who he is here's the funny thing yeah. you could say anything about George Santos yeah. as ridiculous as you want and I am like by law required to believe you because yeah. of how many truly ridiculous things he mm -hmm. has said or done. You could yeah. be like, George Santos claimed he was part of the moon landing. And I was like, that sounds like something he would say. It's I true. believe that. Yeah. 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 He's I just wish he was a villain because I think he was made for reality television. I think he was made for, to. I would think he was made to be the villain sure. of reality television. I think what we missed in his arc <laughs> is him 
on reality television right. before he got elected. It's also like the, the uh, unspoken rule about being a gay pop culture figure yeah. is you're allowed to be mean and catty, yeah. but you have to be nice at the start. And he was a Republican. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like Trixie Mattel's hilarious and legitimately like mean. Yeah. Um, <laughs> George Santos like voted against aid for hurricane victims. Like you can't, and then stole money. Right, from... you, that can't be your origin story. No. Anyway, so the last thing I want to say about coming out, like the history of the term coming out, yeah. is you could tell that it started to gain gain steam in the seventies and eighties because it started to be adopted by journalism for like kind of two different purposes. First, they would be like, oh. George Santos came out, and that would be their way of signaling right. he came out as gay. But they also started to do other things, like um, President Biden comes out in favor of student loan relief. Oh. And the term closet, closet case, comes from a quote that was like, when you just stop being like ashamed and in the closet, which is mm. supposed to be kind of a hyperbole for being like yeah. a, like a closed off but then yeah. the word closet becomes also part of mainstream culture and so you'll get things like oh they're a closet conservative or they're a closet vegan things like that and it's you can see this, I, I was trying to think of a non-political example i was like uh, uh, quickly don't lose the smoothness vegan <laughs> do you mean tyler <laughs> No, he is an outward. He's, he has come out openly as a vegetarian. He's a closeted meat eater. He's a closeted meat eater. <laughs> he's a closeted meat eater, outwardly vegetarian, also outwardly tight ass. Yeah. And so, <laughs> overcook, undercook. You know, kind of, kind of moment. So, the phrase coming out, honestly, even the experience of intentionally coming out is really, really new in, like, gay history and gay culture. Mm -hmm. um, you could also argue that a lot of people felt compelled to come out because of the HIV-AIDS epidemic. Um, getting to that towards, like, the very end of the episode. But right. that disease, especially in the 80s and 90s, was so stigmatized mm -hmm. around gay people and gay men specifically that... If you were dying of AIDS, it essentially forced you out of the closet, regardless of what your own opinion was on it. Yeah, that's fair. And so with that, you have this whole generation of people who might have otherwise been totally fine mm -hmm. being gay in like New York or Chicago or LA or San Francisco mm -hmm. and out to their friends and performing in comedy bars, things like that. Yeah. But you're like, you're not calling home to Nebraska to be yeah. like, mom, here's what's going okay, on. Yeah. Right. And like, maybe, maybe they do know, or you just like, don't really talk about it. Mm -hmm. Lord knows I understand navigating at times awkward family dynamics from the Midwest yes. on this topic. But, you know, it became something that you can kind of put to the side. Oh, it was great to see David in the city this weekend. Yes, we brought he brought us to this really cool bar and we had this great restaurant that his friend cooks at. But now it's like David's been diagnosed with the disease that is highly stigmatized. Yeah. And so that force is coming out too. Yikes. So all of that is now to say we're going to get into some gay ass people in history. Hell yes. And I am so excited about it. And for those of you with your little smartphones, clickety clacketing a message to us right now, I want to start off this whole conversation and I'll repeat it at the end with this. I do not view pondering if some of these historical people were gay or not as offensive. I don't view it as derogatory because to be gay isn't derogatory. I'm not making fun of them. I'm not diminishing their legacy. We are looking at historical evidence and wondering if they're part of a community that wasn't allowed to exist at the time. If you think we are ruining their legacy by talking about their potential gay sexuality, work on your own internalized homophobia. Let's go ahead and talk about, if we need to cut that, that's fine. But <laughs> I am. <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, that's your prerogative. Okay. <laughs> Sorry if that came on a little strong. I just wanted to make it clear. Um, We've gotten through. We, we, we got a lot of cyberbullying in the last week. If, if, if you're current, uh, well, we're recording this in, in beginning of March. When this comes out, if you're like, remember that one week where there were no reels that they posted? <laughs> you were mean to us. Yeah. Uh, my little rap brain said, well, why are we editing reels if no one appreciates it? No, great. The, and, uh, that reel did get half a million views. <laughs> yeah, it did. And we also got paid from it, which is why it was worth why I didn't shut down the whole thing. But anyway, we're, we're going a little overboard in the other direction of letting people know exactly what our stance is. So if they have the audacity to come at us on social media, and most of the time, you're right. And we appreciate it. However, when it is notification after notification after notification for 72 hours, 
brother, I'm gonna sh- I'm I'm gonna delete the whole thing. Also, a lot of them were super sexist towards you. Thank you. It wasn't even about, I think about the topic. The it was like this woman needs to stop interrupting this white man who's saying things I want to hear. <laughs> and it's like, babes, go back and watch all of the clips, including that one. I interrupt you all the time. <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't. It was also because it was right after the one that we posted about my reactions to the ocean, which was funny mm-hmm. in its own right. And that one actually didn't bother me when people were like, God, she's so annoying. I was like, yeah, it was a little annoying. But then like immediately after that, they're like, this girl needs to learn how to shut up. Yeah, <laughs> like, they were Babe, I'm going to strangle mean. you. <gasps> oh. And I anyway. kept trying to delete them as quickly as possible, but I knew you were getting them notified oh, yeah. on your screen. So there was no way I could prevent you. Anyways, um, that fine. little tirade is also because there is a certain conversation, sub-conversation happening Mm -hmm. about whether or not it's even appropriate to speculate on the Mm. sexuality of some of these historical figures. And I would just argue that it's only inappropriate if you think being gay is inappropriate. And it's actually, you know how everything's kind of a circle, kind of comes back to each other? You might think talking about someone being gay is inappropriate, because for you, gay is still like kind of a new modern taboo topic. But gay people have always existed. And you know why we don't know that? Because we haven't studied gay history. And so like, oh, now we're back to where we started. So now we're Mm going to talk about some historical gay figures. And England had a lot of gay kings. England they had a lot of... They do today still. <laughs> hey, London, I'll be back in the summer. But, uh... <laughs> specifically the yeah. rain kind. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, so let's first talk about, um... I saved both, right? Did I? I want to make sure I did. Come back did. next week. <laughs> <laughs> As Grant reads, his own notes. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to go super far back first. Um, And then we're going to... Yep, okay. So, the first English king I want to talk about is King Richard I of England, also known as Richard the Lionheart. Mm. So, first, this guy, absolute boss. He becomes king of England and then leaves England immediately. (laughs) (laughs) At this time, England has a bunch of land holdings in what we would now consider France and like Belgium and stuff. Mm -hmm. And he spends basically the entire time there. He marries his wife is almost never with her and produces zero children. Ah. Total bachelor, total total stud, right? <laughs> <laughs> so he spends a lot of time in what we would now consider France. And do you know who else is there? What? The king of the Franks, which is <laughs> going to be France. Um, and his name is Philip II. Ah. And King Richard I and Philip II, well, they were best buds. Aww. How how good of best buds were they? Best friends. Best friends. <laughs> best friends. Um, a person, uh, one of the one of the royal secretaries oh. for the English king, King Richard the First, at the time, at the time, wrote this, and I quote: King Richard, who hardly spent any time with his wife and had no. Ch- oh, hold on, this is not the quote. Oh. I'm getting to the quote, though. Um, Who had no children and hardly spent any time with his wife, was rumored to have enjoyed a scandalous affair with King Philip II of France. His royal secretary, Roger Hovden, wrote that the two, quote, ate every day at the same table and from the same dish, and at night their beds did not separate. Wow. I know that was us in Prague. <laughs> <laughs> Do they have separate comforters, though? I need to know. <laughs> um, did one of them have a sleep apnea machine? or? <laughs> because I really need to know about that. <laughs> uh, yeah, King Richard I and King Philip II of France, best, fu- best buds, spent all the time together. It was kind of speculated at the time. But also, uh, record scratch, plot twist... Maybe we don't actually have the social context at the time. Oh. Maybe eating from the same plate and sleeping in the same bed together is kind of like the modern day equivalent of like a press conference. Or a slumber party uh, yeah. like you had with Tyler. Okay, Tyler slept in my <laughs> guest bedroom. I just didn't invite him into my bedroom. Beds we did touched sh- the floor, the floor touched your bed, and therefore they were still touching. <laughs> it was actually a really cute sleepover. We did eat cookies off the same plate while we were That's watching really Modern cute. Family. I know. Were they protein cookies? Uh, no, but he did make us get the Simply Truth kind so they were gross uh he i wanted the like that. chemical filled pills yeah, you kind. can't let him read the nope. ingredients nope. over anything he reads anything he eats he's yeah. like oh well i mean that that's fine but 
blankety blank is a known carcinogen. 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 And, and I go, cool. So is the lead, air, and water so of Denver's is... West Side. So I'm just gonna probably eat the cookies that taste best. Then. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna die because of chemicals. Exactly. Ex- ex- exactly. If I live past 110, I'm that... like. Mm. This entire neighborhood used to produce tanks for the army, and then everything we've ever pumped into the sky has gotten trapped between these mountains, and we breathe it in every day. And you drive past rocky <laughs> flats every <laughs> so day. <true. laughs> Anyways, um, modern historians argue that much of this lacks the social context that they would have had at the time, and that this may very well have just been a demonstration of kinship and allyship rather than romance. This was a modern day press conference, essentially saying, we are allies, I will not stab you in the back, and to prove that I will not stab you in the back, I'm willing to like be asleep in the same room as you. And not kill you. And not kill you, yes, exactly. Which at that time I'm like, well yeah, like I hardly ever worry about getting stabbed when I'm over at someone else's home. (laughs) Not always, but for the most part. (laughs) These things happen, you know. (laughs) And so it might have been both, or neither, or one or the other, or some third, eighth, mysterious option where they were like, hey, we're just friends, right? But like, just between third, friends. Third, eighth? Or mis- uh, some other mysterious option. <laughs> so that was King Richard I and Philip II. There's a different uh, English king, King James I and VI of England. Um, He's King James of Scotland and oh, King okay. James yes. of England. Yes. He was the first James for one of those countries and the sixth James for the, for other. the other. Yeah. I get so confused with these because I, I like know enough about mm-hmm. like the royal lineage where I'm like, oh, I think I know. And then I'm like, they all had the same name. Like this guy's the yes. sixth. Like yes. how... So I'm like, ooh, is this the guy that's like kind of related <laughs> to the... To, whatever. Uh, I don't know. King James is the child of Mary, Queen of Scots. Oh, okay, yes. this is the James that I was yes. thinking of then. And it's his, he is the first king to jointly rule over yeah. both kingdoms and begins the process of unifying. I know but. Mary, Queen of Scots because of the CW TV show Reign, which is <laughs> not historically accurate, but it is a good show. I know Mary, Queen of Scots because of the movie, I think Mary, Queen of Scots, mm-hmm. starring Seer Sharonin. Yeah, I, when, when I watched Rain, I was like, I wonder how much of this is historically accurate. Mm. The answer is the characters. <laughs> End. That's basically <laughs> it. And like how they, or like the fact that they die or don't die, you know. So let's speculate about another dead guy's sexual proclivities. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes. Um, I can I also say there's something so narrative stealing about the fact that like for almost all queer history, it has been straight people speculating on our sexual preferences mm-hmm. in a way to like endanger us or out us or otherwise manipulate us. That there's some real like joy in flipping that script for a second. Although I'm positive. Is he straight? Although I'm positive <laughs> King James was gay. And here's the evidence. <laughs> Throughout his youth, James <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> Throughout his youth, James was praised for his chastity since he showed little interest in women. Sound like anyone else you know? <laughs> me. Yeah, you. Sounds like me. In my defense, I did have a girlfriend, but uh, everyone needs a cover story. Every gay man that I know had a girlfriend at one point. I do now feel bad about that. but That's, I mean, usually. But I was that <laughs> girlfriend for one of my gay friends. Only so. one? I think so. Yeah. Okay, good, good, good. Okay. Yeah, because after a while I started pining after them and around that time was when they were all coming out and mm. realizing who they were. So they weren't they weren't looking for a beard. They weren't in the market anymore. <laughs> They're like, wow, you're so hot. Where were you literally nine months ago? Also, but... you're going to be my best friend. <laughs> <laughs> and when you find out, you'll find out. <laughs> All now you them. have a podcast with one. You just collect us. We find each other. It's really true. <laughs> At one point, I knew so many people were gay, and people would come up to me. One of my gay friends was like more touchy, and like it was fine. Sure. But he like had his arm around me at one point. They were like, "Are you two an item?" And I was like, <laughs> "Oh, I can't tell you that." <laughs> what you see is what you see. <laughs> I was like, I don't know, maybe. <laughs> Can neither confirm nor deny. I love that you are part of this long history. <laughs> of the gay coming out experience where you come out internally to your friend group and yeah. your community before you come out. We just covered that. You're the debutante balls of the 1930s. It's your history too, Maya. Thank it's you. your history too. <laughs> 
Okay, so let's go back to King James for a second. <laughs> the man who was incredibly chaste and uh, didn't care much for women. <laughs> um, after the loss of um, a man by the name of Lennox, he continued to prefer male company. A suitable marriage, however, was necessary to reinforce his rule, and the choice fell on 14-year-old Anne of Denmark, younger daughter of the Protestant king Frederick II. Mm-hmm. Shortly after, a proxy marriage is held in Copenhagen in August 1589. Anne sailed for Scotland, but was forced by the storms to land on the coast of Norway. So, not no. Scotland at yeah. all. No. Upon hearing this, King James crossed the sea with a 300 strong retinue to fetch Anne. <laughs> what well, one historian would describe. The one romantic episode <gasps> of his life. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> he was like, what, my 14-year-old child bride is across the ocean? I must go rescue her. I think he needed some space from his boyfriend. <laughs> and he was like, babe, I have a work trip. I gotta I, go. I have to go. I'm sorry. It's not go. about you. We always agreed to be open like this. You knew what the <laughs> dynamics <laughs> So he sails across the sea, fetches Anne, comes back, and by all accounts, James was, at least at first, infatuated with Anne, and in the early years of their marriage, seemed to always have shown her patience and affection. That's cute. I know. The royal couple produced three children who survived to adulthood. Really dark disclaimer. Um, Henry, uh, Henry Frederick, Prince of Wales, who died of typhoid fever in 1612. Oh. Um, Elizabeth, later the Queen of Bohemia, and Charles, King Charles, James's oh. successor. Anne died before her husband in March 1619. Oh. So case closed, right? Chastity didn't care for women. Then he gets this hot 14-year-old bride, and he was like, I must go rescue her. And has three children happily ever heterosexual after. Yeah, uh-huh. right? that's the end. No. <laughs> but throughout his life, James had close relationships with male courtiers, Hell which yeah. has caused debate among historians about their exact nature. Oh. In Scotland, Anne Murray was known as the king's mistress. After his ascension to the throne in England, his peaceful and scholarly attitude contrasted sharply with the former ruler, Queen Elizabeth, Mm -hmm. who was seen as both uh, flirtatious and bellicose. And it created this phrase. They said it in Latin, but it translates to, Elizabeth was king. Now, James is queen. queen. Oh, shit. That's also why I think he might have been gay, because that's such a good line. Is this that's Queen so Elizabeth mean. the... The first. The, uh, the white paint on the face and the red curly hair. Yeah, the daughter of Anne Boleyn. Um, yeah, I think so. The I one who she... has Mary, Queen of Scots, executed. Yes, yes. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, some of James' bi- biographers conclude that Esme Stewart, the Duke of Lennox, Robert Carr, the Earl of Somerset, and George Villers, Duke of Buckingham, were all King James's lovers. Wow. Um, one historian observed that, quote, never yet saw any... F- Let me say that again. That he quote that King James never yet saw any fond husband make so much or so great dalliance over his beautiful spouse as I have King James over his favorites, especially the Duke of Buckingham. Translation: I've never seen a husband treat his wife as well as King James <laughs> treats his boyfriend. <laughs> Ladies, if he wanted to, he would. He would. He <laughs> would. Uh, that's hysterical. Um, also, what a phenomenal way to get all the eyes off of you is to just have an air. Exactly. Just be like, you know what? Leave me alone. I've done what you I've needed done me the to job. do. I've done the job. I had a daughter and a son that lived. I even <laughs> door dashed my own wife, okay? <laughs> I got I her picked here. Her up. I had three in case one died, and one of them did die at 18 <laughs> from typhoid fever. Okay, the line is fine. Everyone's at peace. I'm going to go hang out to with sell my boyfriend. Off to whoever. Exactly. <laughs> Goodbye. He, like, closes the door, yeah. and all you hear is, You better work. <laughs> and it's like, You false drag race. <laughs> Gentlemen, start your engines. That was a reference to That's RuPaul's Drag Race. So funny. <laughs> it's either that or I'm beautiful in the way. There's karaoke exactly, in the back. Gimme, gimme, gimme a man after midnight. Singing podcast. <laughs> How weird would it be if it was a single mom who works two jobs and it was Queen Anne's room? <laughs> 
King Elizabeth. <laughs> She got the karaoke system set up to let off steam. <laughs> okay, so there's a little bit. I was. This is what I wanted out of this episode. I was like, let's just be kind of catty and queer for a second and just all up in it. Okay, so um, the Duke of Buckingham, who the king would were called Edward Peyton, a contemporary at the time, tumble and kiss as a mistress. Restoration of the Apethorpe, Apethorpe, A P E T H O R P E. All I know is it's not the second one. I know it's not Apothorpe. I know it's I know it's not Ac- uh, Acapulco. Okay, I know it's not Casa Bonita. Um, it is restoration of this palace in the North Hampshires, um, undertaken between 2004 and 2008, revealed something. Um, well, just a just a private little passageway in between the chambers of King James and his lovers uh, Villers. I want to be that rich. <laughs> Right? Not that I want to have a mistress. I want to have the money to be able to... To have secret passageways have in your home? have secret passageways. 100%. No one yes. really talks about the millennial DIY home improvement dream, which yes. is bookshelf that leads to secret room that not everyone knows about. Yes. Yes. <laughs> also, and I wrote this in my notes about King James. Yes. Secret tunnel! tunnel. Secret tunnel! More than one secret in that tunnel. So. <laughs> Side note, the live action version of Avatar Last Airbender released like a couple weeks ago and Casey and I watched the first episode. Um, it's good, it's good. It's better than the movie. Uh, the visuals, amazing. The bending, amazing. They kept to the storyline. I've only seen like two or three things so okay. far that are non-canon. Acting, terrible. <laughs> oh no. It is all kids though, so I'm sure. hoping that it's like a Harry Potter moment. Because if you watch the first Harry Potters, you're like, no, oh, these are children. Yeah, these these <laughs> kids have like are reading off of. Where's my hot Neville somewhere. Longbottom? <laughs> yeah. So I'm hoping that if they like keep it up, it'll get really good. Okay. You know, is but, it worth starting? Yeah, just for the visuals. Okay. If because you watch the cartoons. I did. I love the cartoons. Yeah, it's if, it's like nostalgic in a way that's like. Oh. My, I think my life is actually dedicated, broken up into three seasons. Mm-hmm. It's Downton Abbey, which is late summer into mm-hmm. fall. And then in late fall, November, there's a little Christmas movie stuff. Yeah. And then in January, I kind of always restart Modern Family. Mm-hmm. And then that ends usually right around the time school is ending, ah. or a little bit sooner. And then I watch Avatar The Last Airbender. Excellent. And then the cycle repeats itself. That's a good cycle. So long ago, the four shows <laughs> lived in harmony. <laughs> Thank you. I thought that was funny. <laughs> they do change the opening, like thing. no. Well, at least for the first episode. I don't know if it was different, but they have a moment where Gam Gam like is recites the entire entrance, and I, it took everything in me not to be like long ago, because <laughs> I knew Casey would have probably like socked me in the face. That's but. so funny. Honestly, that needs to be a Patreon episode of just us watching the live action version. Yes, Barbie. amazing. Okay, so those first two, first three, if you count uh, King Philip the second it's difficult because there's never a moment where it's like look at this person no no homosexual right even the people who write about the kings at the time are like well everybody knows but like you know we'll give you all the social hints but then the social hints all change exactly exactly all the social context for it changes i don't know maybe there was business matters and that's why they needed a secret unknown tunnel between their chambers yeah that makes sense also i'm just the, there's like the, the architect in me is like, is it a tunnel if it's just a door to the next room? Or like, did it really have to be like a hallway that connected their rooms together? And if so, how was that house laid out in a way that you could have like a secret hallway between your guys' rooms and not be passing directly through other rooms, you know? Here's what I think probably, and I'm probably wrong, I'm just speculating, <laughs> is that these castles didn't always start as castles, mm-hmm. right? They would start as like part of a building and then they'd add Just certain keep, things yeah, 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 on. Yeah. And I'm sure it wasn't as efficient as it is like now sure. where like there's a wall and then immediate, you know, on the other side of any wall is another room. Right. You know, I'm sure there was like, well, there's just this gap it's between... It's way more compound Yeah, there's yeah. probably just, like, more space. Like, alleyways But then how do you keep that city. secret? I mean, obviously, I'm sure it makes more sense if you, like, look at the picture and stuff, but I was just fascinated by all of that. Yeah, I don't know how you keep it secret. I mean, you just gotta look, right? Right. 
So, if we are charting our gay history, we started in the 1930s with the use of the term coming out and how that developed within the community. Then I shot us back into history to kings that were maybe out, kind of, or just liked what they liked. Did some weird things if they weren't gay. And I think it's also kind of notable that a lot of these people uh, had the power of the entire state behind them and could then kind of do whatever they wanted to. Like, Mm -hmm. are you going to punish the king for something, especially in <laughs> like a monarchical system like that. Do it, especially after King Henry VIII or whatever the fuck. His right, name is. exactly. So I think you know they're insulated from any kind of repercussions yeah. and maybe don't need to define themselves in ways that we would today, or didn't have the language for it. Yeah. But then you move through history a little bit more, and you get other people with queer histories. But then these queer histories that are acknowledged in a more contemporary sense always seem to be explained away. For instance, oh sure, this man laid with men, but it's only because he was so voracious, so much of a player, that he slept with anybody. He's and when he said anybody, <laughs> he meant anybody, he right? Bye, queen. Like for instance, friend of the podcast, Lord Byron. <laughs> <laughs> friend or enemy. Exactly, exactly. You decide. So here's my, here's my little clip about Lord Byron. Okay. Okay. Uh, it is startling to consider how many cultural cliches originated from George Gordon, a.k.a. Lord Byron, who lived George and died Gordon. rough. I know. <laughs> GG. Hey, GG. That's such a shitty name compared to Lord Byron. I know. George Gordon. <laughs> <laughs> um, who lived and died near, roughly two centuries ago. Vampires, to begin with, as Anne Rice's vampire, uh, currently the Dean of the Undead, owes its existence to the villain of the first ever English language vampire tale. I'm going to need you to say vampire. that whole sentence again. Yeah, that was I just, confusing. They use the word vampire many times yeah. to be clever in their writing, and Vampires exist because of Lord Byron's thing at Lake the, Geneva. Okay, cool. The, the, the thing. The same thing that the Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein yeah, yeah, yeah. at. Yes, okay, exactly. Cool. Pause. Uh, we're announcing... Oh, no, we can share this. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, I'm pausing the okay. Lord Byron stuff. We're announcing the spring play on Friday. <gasps> and so today I put up... I think 13 You're gonna plays. Do the thing. Correct. Are you I'm going to re- going to take a couple down every day yes. as a chance to talk about literature. Totally saw it on TikTok from that one yes. music theater teacher. Uh, so I, many are doing it. Now. Right. And I, yeah. right, exactly. I'm not going to film it oh, cuz yeah. I'm not I'm not a clout chaser that way, you know. You should, I mean. Should I? You have a podcast. Yes, you should. But we'll have to make sure none of the kids' voices are in it. That's fine. It's a room of 32 children. Don't figure it out. Put, put like the voice Imagine changer over all of them. Imagine they come and the ring light set up. Imagine the kid that shows up late and they're like, what is going what on? What the fuck? They have their like toast with jam <laughs> and milk Talkies. carton. And they're just talk. Yes, exactly. Anyways, one of the plays I put up is Frankenstein. And that's not what we're doing. But it's a Can chance to talk about doing? Frankenstein. Yes. Because this won't come out until after. Um, too much light makes the baby go blind. It's a series yeah, okay. of like sketches that you can incorporate as many actors as oh, you that's want. Fun. It's great for a dynamic cast yeah. where you don't know how, how many, many people are going to uh, try out. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> um, I will tell you. What are you, the other ones that are on? on the oh, God, you're really testing my memory right now. Um, the Pillow Man, Much Ado About Nothing, yes. Radium Girls. Uh, I almost put up Year in Town, but they know we're not going to do a musical. Mm. Um, what else is up? The 39 Steps, uh, the 25th Annual Putnam Callie and Spelly Bee. That one's good. Everything I Know I Learned Isn't in that Kindergarten. Isn't a musical, too, though? Um, or, yeah, or you can do, I think, as a, oh, as you a can? play I version, I think. I've seen it in speech and debate loads of times. Yeah, there's a lot of like, yeah. monologues. Yeah, yeah. And... Um, and there's other ones, too. Steel Magnolia. Magnolias is up there. The Wasp, Living Out by Lisa Loomer. Um, Did you do Glass Menagerie? I didn't. I like that one. <laughs> I was it's doing this sad. in between quick kids' no. quizzes today. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> We're back into the world of vampires and Lord nice. Byron. Sorry, if you're like, skip, skip, why are they still talking about high school theater? It's a gay history episode. Why do you think we're talking about <laughs> high school theater? <laughs> so, Lord Byron's responsible for things like the vampire, for Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Mm-hmm. He's responsible for a bunch of cultural kind of touch points today. And he was also a notorious ladies' man at the time. He was engaged to a woman and told him about some of his exploits. And she was so repulsed that she told her parents. Her parents told everyone. And he was essentially banished <gasps> from England. He did a big tour because his reputation was already in shambles in England at the time. 
I love that. Now, this is where I want to talk so about dramatic. this aspect of Lord Byron's life. So Lord Byron has documented like several male lovers in his lifetime, including one like young individual in, I believe, Italy. Do I have his name? No, I don't. Um, but he was like obsessed with several people in his life. Um, one of his young lovers, Lord Byron just rented out a mansion for this young man until mm -hmm. the young man was old enough to be able to inherit it on his own. He had lots of relationships. His life was defined by the women and children he produced. Don't forget, uh, Miss Lovelace yes. had one of his children. Lord Byron is also tangentially responsible for like computer coding, mainly because he was so debaucherous in his own life. Yeah, that Ada was like, fuck it, I'm gonna do whatever I want. <laughs> Ada was like, you will never read a poem your entire life. <laughs> or read a single piece of fiction, you will be a science girly. And so amazing. you have characters like Lord Byron throughout history whose sexuality gets explained away, not as like an authentic part of their like lived experience, but it's just an explanation for how sexually active this person was, that it was mm -hmm. kind of anyone within arm's reach to each other. And that that is still gay erasure. It's like essentially yeah. trying to justify a way why this person would engage in same-sex relations. And so I put at the bottom of the Lord Byron notes that I wrote here, Lord Byron's modern reputation was like, Lord Byron can't be gay. He loves women so much. But the women he loves are like Britney Spears, Carly Rae Jepsen, yeah. and Casey Musgraves. <laughs> It's like, I also love and respect women. It's why I don't date them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Also, you can like both. Right, exactly. My man. That is also a real and legitimate yeah. experience. Yeah. Um, <laughs> my bi women and their boyfriends joke notwithstanding. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Yes. Okay, so we've covered a lot of historical figures, a lot of British gay historical figures. Let's bring it to America real quick. Yes. What president has faced gay rumors? Oh, fuck. Many of you in the car right now are probably shouting. Screaming. Oh my God, is he doing Abraham Lincoln again? <laughs> <laughs> and the answer is no. Mm. I'm doing the president right before Lincoln. Yeah, good luck. James I don't know. Buchanan. Okay, cool. I did know that, yeah, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. America's reckon... only bachelor president. Yeah. yeah! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. AP West History sometimes comes up, has a weird way of coming back to me, and it only comes back to me when Grant does history <laughs> Um I think we've gotten some feedback recently that that's kind of becoming a universal experience. Of yeah. like, wait, was there an article about this one time in Mr. Smith's class? Oh, my God. Did my, I read that one book? Mr. Salem. Now, be careful to say that because you said it. Um, we're going to get a lot of comments that are like, yeah, you dumb bitch. If you just wouldn't talk so much in class with your woman mouth, you would have been able to learn a thing or two. Grant this week learned about misogyny on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to say anything because I thought I was being sensitive. <laughs> no, no, and then no, when no, Grant no, no. said it, I was like, oh my God, thank you. <laughs> when it becomes your job to like... <laughs> moderate the comment section of the internet kind of radicalizes you <laughs> wow people all suck <laughs> i'm just like a soft tender soft boy like my favorite thing to wear is crew necks like, <laughs> why would you be so mean to strangers and why? even worse why would you be so mean to me <laughs> <laughs> i'm so fragile anyways so james buchanan is the only American president mm -hmm. who was never married over the course of his lifetime and is thus the only American president that, that didn't has. have a first lady. That's James wild. Buchanan's first lady, the person who stepped into that role, mm -hmm. was his niece. And I think that's actually the gayest that's, fact about yeah, him. Yeah, that is. So sweet, but the like gay uncle-niece connection. That is an unbreakable connection. That's really yeah. strong. Yeah. I'm so excited for you to have a niece. <laughs> Same. And I, I really hope Griffin and Taylor keep trying until I hit one. <laughs> love you both. Imagine you get six nephews. They still listen, and it's so sweet. I love that. I love you. 
So uh, James Buchanan is plagued by a bunch of gay rumors. Sure, because his niece was his first lady. Sure, because he was never married. But also mainly because he had just like a really intensely strong male friendship. Mm. Um, They lived together. They traveled together. They like shared secrets with each other. All (laughs) sorts of stuff. And this is now where the American Experience article. Oh, no, I'm sorry. This is from the Smithsonian Museum on American History. Their article comes in. This understanding of male friendship pays close attention to the historical context of the time. Basically that James and his bestie weren't lovers, but just besties. Just besties. Just besties. (laughs) An exercise that requires one to read the sources judiciously. In the rush to make new meaning of the past, I have come to understand why today it has become uh, de rigueur. I don't know know why the Smithsonian Museum is using French. Which one? (laughs) Rigueur. I hate French. (laughs) (laughs) I know that it's come to be considered popular. There it is. um, To consider Buchanan our first gay president. Simply put, that characterization underscores a powerful force at work in historical scholarship. The search for a usable queer past. Mm. Yes, King, you get it. Certainly. Uh, They cherished their uh, friendship with each other, as did members of their immediate families. Um, At Wheatland, James Buchanan's country estate near Lancaster, Pennsylvania, he hung up a portrait of his bestie, William Rufus King, and Rufus's niece, Catherine Margaret Ellis. So he's not only friends with his (laughs) niece, he's friends with his best friend's niece? That's, listen, ladies, we said it before, but if he wanted to, no, I'm kidding. (laughs) That is... There's no better way to get in with your partner than to get in with your partner's family. Yes. That is the easiest way to win that battle. Yes. And so James Buchanan just has a picture of his bestie. Uh, That's let me get really the name sweet. again. Because there's like three and they all sound like first names. <laughs> William Rufus King, Anne King's niece, Catherine Margaret Ellis. After Buchanan's death in 1868, Buchanan's niece... Harriet Lane Johnston. Sorry, there's just so many long names in this. There's so many names. Who played the part of First Lady in Buchanan's White House, corresponded with Ellis about retrieving her uncle's correspondence from uh, the Rufus King estate. So in other words, they were besties. They lived together for a long time. Their nieces were familiar with each other. And after President James Buchanan passed away, his niece... Confat contacted William Rufus King's niece to be like, hey, hey, can I have those letters? Can I get my uncle's letters back? Yes, exactly. Yeah. More it's than like, delete my web search history, please. Uh, yeah, girl, we're getting there. <laughs> oh, yeah, are you kidding? Oh, yeah, there's a line that you are going to love that I think is also super incriminating, <laughs> even more than having a close relationship with your niece. Uh, more than 60 personal letters still survive, including several that contain expressions of the most intimate kind. Unfortunately, we can only read one side of the correspondence. Mm. The letters King sent to Buchanan, because okay. Buchanan kept them. Right. One popular misconception holds that their nieces destroyed their uncle's letters by prearrangement. But That's the, hilarious. Yes, that they were like, they're going to be gay, and then as soon as they die, no, they weren't. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to burn these in the fire. Exactly. No, so I'm going to, sorry. I know we've been pausing a lot in this story. There's just kind of, it's just kind of a just conversation gonna happen, today. It's going to happen, yeah. Um, I was listening to this interview from a woman who works for the Mississippi Historical Society, and she shared the story about there is this man who um, was passing away, and he made um, an agreement with the Mississippi Historical Society that his letters, personal effects, things like that would be given to the Mississippi Historical Society, part of which documented the life and experience of being a gay man in Mississippi Mm. during his lifetime. And so he passes away. The Mississippi Historical Society gets notified he's passed away. They contact the family saying like, hey, on Friday, we're going to swing by and pick up all that stuff. And when they come on Friday, the family has intentionally (gasps) destroyed everything. In memory, their relative will not be remembered the way he wished. I know. Honestly, I think I read that story about a year ago or saw that TikTok of the woman talking about it. I think that's what planted the seed of wanting to do this episode. This episode. It's... 
Yeah. This entire episode, of course, it feels like hyperbole. Mm-hmm. You're connecting things in the dark from people who didn't get a chance to comment on it. Yeah. But as this article from the Smithsonian said, it's this search for a queer history, like a usable queer past that was either destroyed by queer people, kept hidden intentionally by queer yeah. people, or then destroyed by those who are closest to those queer people after they passed away. Yeah. Right? That, like, once you're gone, how you're remembered is really up to the people closest to you. I mean, it could also be that they ex- explicitly asked like or maybe the nieces were doing it in an effort not to like change history but also to protect them like we don't want Buchanan's history to be overwritten by the fact that he was gay right and instead we want him to be remembered for what he did which was one of the least effective presidents in US history Uh, maybe did more than any other president to cause the civil war but that's I mean not currently this conversation (laughs) back this this conversation up 20 20 years just want to remind you about five episodes ago James Buchanan is told about what's happened in Harper's Ferry, West Virginia, yeah. by the uh, Baltimore Railroad Company. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, oh. Um, so there is this kind of misconception that the nieces, by pre agreement, destroyed the letters intentionally. Mm-hmm. But that's probably just more like us judging them for the way other people have done it in the past. Yeah. There's other reasons as to why these letters did not last. For one, the King's Family Plantation was raided during the Battle of Selma in 1865. Yeah, that'll do it. And a lot of stuff got burnt down. Yeah. Second, flooding along the Selva, Selma River destroyed portions of King's papers prior to they, them being deposited at the Alabama Department of Archives. And then finally, King dutifully followed Buchanan's instructions mm. and destroyed numerous letters marked yeah. private or confidential. So sorry, I hit you. Yeah, uh, the end result is that relatively few letters of any kind survive in the various papers of William Rufus King, and even fewer have ever been prepared for publication. Yeah. So there's not a lot of letters that King has. Buchanan documented way more of his stuff, but probably also judiciously chose what to keep and not keep. Yeah. A lot of the gay rumors then don't come from our reading now of their letters in the past, right. but from the reputation they had at the time. William Rufus King was referred to as James Buchanan's better half in social papers, in, like, polite conversation. That's really cute. I know. A lot of people, like, even comment at the time that, like, I wish you knew me the way that, like, Buchanan (laughs) and William Rufus King know each other, you know? Even if they're not gay for each other, like, that is just a sweet friendship. I know. Yeah. I saw that, and I was like, that's super sweet and a little gay, and also really does characterize my relationship with Lydia. (laughs) Yes. 100%. I am proudly a companion. They know each other so well. 13 years. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so... um, in social papers at the time, and conversation, and letters between people who aren't Buchanan or Rufus King, when they're like, oh, I went over to the Buchanan King household, blah, 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 like this mm. was the experience that I had and whatnot. Um, that's where we start to get this perception of an unusually close friendship with each right. other. And then we actually have a letter from James Buchanan, who wrote it to the Roosevelt family up in New York. See, Rufus King was preparing to go on like an overseas trip. Mm-hmm. And because I think traveling at the time was so awful, he had to like rest up for the journey in New York. So it was like, leave Alabama, get, get to, to New, New York, York rest, rest, and then get on it. And where do you rest? Well, at the home of your millionaire friend, the Roosevelts. Casual. Um, And so this is the letter Buchanan uh, wrote the Roosevelt family. And I quote, I envy Colonel King the pleasure of meeting you and would give anything in reason to be party for a single week. Okay, that's a long time. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I know we're one sentence in. but like, It is a long time to have guests. Right. I yeah. think I, I, obviously time just worked different then because yes. if I have friends stay at my house two days in a row, I go hurt hermit on the third day when they have to leave. Yeah, and I assume the Roosevelt's probably had help. Sure, 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 sure. And multiple rooms. Yeah, multiple rooms. And what would they do? It's not like they had a job to get to. Yeah, it's even like... (laughs) It's even like if, they, if if someone's staying with them, it's not like they're like, well, what do you want to do today? You know, it's like, you can... Right. 
Well, honestly, we're so glad you're here. You helped round out our badminton numbers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can take one of our horses out. Exactly. <laughs> just make sure you put them down when you're done, just okay? Ask mm, for the, that's the spare ask horse. Ask for the stable hands. Exactly. <laughs> They'll help you out. Ask for the handsome stable boy. <laughs> <laughs> you would like that, wouldn't that you, was Ralph? So dumb. <laughs> I promise I won't tell the missus. I'm sorry, James. <laughs> this is canon now. It's in my okay head. <laughs> for us to say it. It's funny now. It's also like a historical reference to what yeah. they called each other at the time. So yeah. let me read this letter again. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I was only one sentence in. I envy Colonel King the pleasure of meeting you and would give anything in reason to be party for a single week. I am now solitary and alone, oh. having no companion in the house with me. I have gone... I have no money. And no <laughs> prospects. <laughs> I'm already a burden to my staff. <laughs> and I'm horny. I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> One hand of three. Coming this season on the Discovery <laughs> Channel. <Coming> or not. <laughs> <laughs> it's not even a Patreon episode. Okay, so... um. <laughs> Having no companion in the house with me, I have gone a wooing to several gentlemen, but have not succeeded with any of them. I feel you, brother. <laughs> I feel that this is not good for a man to be alone, and should not be astonished to find myself married to some old maid who can nurse me when I am sick, provide good dinners for me when I am well, and not expect from me any very ardent or romantic affection. You just want a housekeeper, James, President Buchanan. <laughs> or me. <laughs> exactly. Just kidding, I can't cook. <laughs> but she will supply you with a lifetime supply of cheese. And I will never bother you. <laughs> so um, that's, a, that's a pretty lovey-dovey letter about both King, and, but also yeah. pretty dismissive of the idea of a wife. <laughs> uh, now, this is yes. where I want to say early on that James Buchanan was engaged early in his life to a woman. And there's a lot of mystery. You get the sense from some historical record keepers that there was maybe a bit of a cover up. But essentially, James is um, engaged to be married to a woman and works a lot. And then uh -huh. that marriage gets called off before it ah. occurs. And then the woman dies oh. from, at the time, what they called kind of like potentially just like a broken heart, which might have been... Anything. Correct. <laughs> correct. <laughs> and Heartburn. I do think James is sad. Um, but it sounds like he's like, I'm so sad. I couldn't even think about dating anymore. <laughs> All I'm not, become, the idea of another woman will just <laughs> disrespect their memory. Exactly. The one woman I wouldn't find an old maid. Gone forever. Oh, no. I guess I'll just become super wealthy and successful and a future president. Oh, hi. What's your name? Rufus? <laughs> this is going to work. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be okay. So James Buchanan was previously engaged, and then that fell through. And you know the historical record isn't official and the like now that he had an excuse he was able to do whatever he wants but from what we know from the lived experiences of gay people today is that like a good cover can go a long way yes. even after that cover is gone right and i think there's also potentially this chance that maybe james buchanan wasn't our first gay president but was instead maybe our first like asexual uh, president, like just a person who that didn't seem to really interest him all yeah. that much for. Yeah. Certainly when he's becoming president of the United States, he's like a more older, distinguished gentleman. So when, when, it wouldn't have been appropriate to document him as like a philanderer. Mm -hmm. And it probably wouldn't have been appropriate for him to conduct himself that way. Right. But he certainly isn't remembered as some great wooer of women when he's older. He is known as very personable. He's known as very charming. And William Rufus King is known as a bit more effeminate and a bit shy in nature. But their temperaments balanced each other out. Yeah. It's just... As this article says, a usable queer past oftentimes has to be constructed by like reading through the tea leaves and imprinting more recent history that we have the ability to understand and acknowledge. And it's like, if that is 
President James Buchanan's story, it's one that we've heard before, right? Like I had a cover, that cover worked for a really long time. I threw myself into my work. And then thankfully, I was kind of then just old enough that I stopped being bothered about that topic. And I was able just to move on. <laughs> nice. Heard and same. There was a year in which I was asked by all my aunts if I had a girlfriend. And then there was a year where no one asked me that question ever again. <laughs> <laughs> they were like, oh. And what's so funny is I'm pretty sure all my cousins no, but I've never yeah. had like the aunts, uncles. Your cousins were like, stop asking Exactly. Him. <laughs> in fact, I think I told one of my closest cousins, you know, we're out for drinks one night when I'm visiting, and I'll like, oh, I'm gay, just so you know. And he goes, yeah, I we I, figured. Granted, I've known you your entire life. And it's like, we cool, deduced. Cool, cool. Don't tell your mom. <laughs> <laughs> he immediately went home and exactly. was like, <laughs> mom. <laughs> So, uh, certainly the quest for a usable queer past has yielded much good. This is now the closing from that article mm -hmm. from the Smithsonian. Has yielded much good. Yet the specifics of this case actually obscure a more interesting and perhaps more, histor more significant historical truth. That an intimate male friendship between two bachelor Democrats, William Rufus King and James Buchanan... Uh, helped shape the direction and course of their party, and by extension, the nation. They're some of the first active members of the Democratic Party uh, in the 1850s and 40s, and that's mm -hmm. a party that still exists today. Yeah. And that, worse still, moving Buchanan and King from friends to lovers blocks the way for a person today to assume the proper mantle of becoming our first gay president. Right. That if we're like giving away that recognition title. title to a person who didn't claim it, and we don't necessarily have rock solid proof was, yeah. then you end up discrediting the accomplishment of what will be eventually the America's first gay first president. Gay president. Mm -hmm. Until that inevitable day comes to pass, these two bachelors from the antebellum past may be the next closest thing. And then the last note I had for that article is what's super ironic is that the president that then follows Buchanan is Abraham Lincoln, who also had a super close male friendship Aye. and, you know, faces his own kind of gay rumors. Yeah. Um, let's just pause for a second. Let's start a gay rumor about Trump. <laughs> Don't put that on us. <laughs> <laughs> you know, him and Pence had a really bad breakup. My favorite, <laughs> my favorite SNL skit, yeah. or maybe it was an article from The Onion. It was um, <laughs> uh, Mike Pence asks waiter to remove Mrs. Butterworth yes. from the table. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Let's okay, so I'm actually going to cover our. I'm actually just going to kind of skip our last historical figure to move into a bit more of a contemporary era. Okay. I've been, I think, on this topic now for over an hour and just a bunch of old, dead historical <laughs> gay dudes. White gay dudes. Like, white. I'm recognizing... Are I'm, you going to talk about George Santos next? <laughs> <laughs> is he? Is he not? Is he not? <laughs> um, anyways, because you pronounce this Tchaikovsky, right? The famous composer. Tchaikovsky. Tchaikovsky, thank yeah. you. Uh, so Tchaikovsky's gay past is super well documented in all of his letters uh, to basically every single person he ever wrote, mm -hmm. including his family, where he was like, oh man, I hung out with this like hot dude who loves men with beards, and then my friend came over and stared out my window at all the Russian cadets, <laughs> and I told him not to do that, that's bad, but he did it anyways, and then I was cruising in Rome, and they almost beat me to death, but I was too smart for that. Anyways, found a different man who just does it for the art, didn't even want my money. Anyways, Dudes be cool. Like that. like my friend Tyler. <laughs> Not Tyler of the podcast, but French uh, Mime. <laughs> French Mime Tyler. Yes, absolutely. You dress weird at one party and you're never going to recover from it. It's not me. It's Grant. It's the only way Grant knows him. <laughs> okay. But that's not the only way you yeah. refer to him. Anyways, okay, I what call about, him counter tenor Tyler. What, what about French Mime Tyler? Oh, he just, every time I talk, we, every time any of us talk to him, he has the craziest stories right. where he's like, anyway, so then I met this guy who just like wanted to buy me a brand new iPhone. <laughs> and uh, then I, I, I let him and he like took me back to his house. And then I said, oh, no, thank you. And then that was it. And Thanks I went our separate iPhone. ways. <laughs> we were all like, you almost died. <laughs> he's like, I was working at Perkins. And then 
And then all my cohort, no one was manning the desk, and, and then my manager was mad, and so I went out to check on them, and they invited me into the back of this truck where they were all smoking weed and doing other drugs. And no, we were like, you are 17. Listen, what you, okay, you actually, this is like the entire second half of this episode, yeah. which is like, what has this culture of secrecy done to yeah. gay people? And it's like, gay people will literally put themselves in like an unsolved murders, like yes! hyperflux of like, you will die in multiple ways. I was like, well, no, so there I was, alone on the sidewalk at 3 a.m. Drunk, lost my phone, couldn't find my friends. When this strange man who thought I was attractive approached me. And it's like, that's usually where it goes, da-dum. Right? Yeah, like, yeah. That's, that's so law and order. SVU begins, babes. What do you mean you were getting waffles in the morning? That's nuts. Yes. How did you not see all of the signs? Because they weren't raised like women were. Right. Of like... <laughs> Be careful, everyone wants to kill you. So, the Russian author, Tchaikovsky. Yes. Um, Tchaikovsky. Tchaikovsky, thank yes. you. Um, pretty well-documented gay person. Mm-hmm. Um, Western Europe, the Americas, recognize him as that. What doesn't recognize him as that is his home country of Russia, yep. who continues <laughs> to insist that uh, he wasn't, and that it's inappropriate to suggest otherwise. <laughs> yes. Exactly. This, I, I, with my eyes, I read the translated version of yeah. Chavosky, Chavos, say it for me. Tchaikovsky. It's my, what was it? Aristocracy. Yeah. This is my Tchaikovsky. word. Tchaikovsky. Chai- Tchaikovsky. Ja- Tchaikovsky. Yes. Okay. Um, There's anyways, a K in there. He wrote Swan's Lake and like all of these really famous yes. ballets, The Nutcracker. Mm-hmm. Anyways, this, I literally read with my own eyes this letter where he was like, yeah, so then I was in the park and I hooked up with this guy and I offered him money and he said no. He does it for the art of it all. And I'm like, what kind of park is that? <laughs> in what world? Hold on. I'm going to look up that I'm not mispronouncing this because I'm going to... I'm not about to get yelled at for this. Oh, at this point, we've already been yelled at, and now they're going to feel bad if they have yelled at us, now that they've been in this part of the (laughs) podcast. Uh, Pronunciation. There it is. Yeah, sorry. He does it for the love of art and adores men with beards. Tchaikovsky. I was right. Okay. He adores men Men with with beards. beards. Which we love. We love that, too. Honestly, it's like a whole page of just really hot and sweaty letters that he wrote to his friends and family about his exploits. It's literally Houdini and uh, <laughs> the guy, who, or Sir Conan Arthur Doyle. Yes. Except being about gay. <laughs> Tchaikovsky and the Russian government. Right, exactly. <laughs> Russian government's like, no. No, you are just like, have a lot of flair. <laughs> I also, it, it's so, it's so wonderful. I've talked about my brother and sister-in-law at many times on this podcast. It is absolutely, for years, Griffin and I have had this tradition. Well, we will call each other on Sundays, Sunday, like kind of mid morning, right before lunch. And we basically just kind of recount what each one of us got up to that Mm -hmm. weekend. And my brother, you know, love him, lives in Omaha, you know, so maybe there's a ceiling as to what, (laughs) as to what him and his friends from middle school managed to get up to Mm -hmm. every weekend. But then he's always like, what did you do this weekend? What was the theme at tracks? Is the shower cage still there at Charlie's? What did you, what did you do when trying to bum a cigarette off someone on the back patio? What did you find out? Who would you, tell me about the world, Grant. Tell me about the, (laughs) tell me about the world, big brother. Tell me about the world. I don't know why I went to little orphan Annie there, but um, (laughs) just this like time honored tradition of gay brother to straight brother being like you should have seen the night I just <laughs> saw so many thoughts like literally weekend. every day I was in Europe uh, with that trip of Danny yes. and Tyler we had a little we had a little gay boys trip about a summer and a half ago every morning when I needed my space I would like step out and call him and be like okay so here's what went down <laughs> In fact, that trip needed that though. It sounded oh, it like did. you guys had you guys got up to it. I uh, this is so fun because this is this is the perfect episode yeah. to tell the story. Part two comes in just a second. We, Part two. Yeah, we're at the halfway point of the oh, story. Oh fuck! Probably. Let me skim it real quick. Uh, uh, yeah, probably about we're part need, two. Uh, let's meet another time to do the double Patreon. Okay. <laughs> I can't. I can't. I told you I have no idea how long this is gonna be. No, it's fair. I knew, I'm not mad. I'm not mad. I knew it was gonna be full of like personal anecdotes throughout. It's just, that's just always so hard to gather. It's check. hard to gather. I'm, I have already skipped paragraphs. I oh, promise you. I'm not mad. I'm just saying. Thank you for saying I'm not mad. <laughs> I'm not mad. Eight fifty six. If you want to read the Okay, so um, I'm on this trip with our friends Tyler and Danny and others, but Tyler and Danny are the ones from the cinematic universe yes. of Willow. Yes, yes, yes. And we are at this gay bar in Rome, mm-hmm. and there's some American service members there with us oh, yeah. because uh, they're on leave from 
wherever. some NATO nation or whatever. Yeah. And that's great. And they're honestly very kind and mm-hmm. they're um, eager to buy you a beer. They are all you know, claiming to be heterosexual men just looking for, like, an interesting evening out, and this bar looked cool. I'm not trying to say anything too much because it's, like, you had to really search for this bar. It's not like we're in the bar district, you yeah. know? Uh, Rome's just a unique and interesting place, and, you know, it was one American talking to another American, and I hadn't, like... I hadn't messed with somebody for a while, <laughs> and I had a couple drinks in me, so I look Grant at this. Loves a prank. I really do. I really <laughs> do, and I speak with the confidence of a white man, because <laughs> I I am a bald white man <laughs> <laughs> with a beard, and so I look at these American Air Force cadets on leave, and I go, Yeah, no, I, I think this bar's vibe super cool. I think it's we're literally in a basement. You had to go down like two flights of stairs to yeah. get there, and I go, I just like really hope we don't get raided because I have not been able to find an exit outside of the main one, and the cadet goes what and i go yeah i mean it's just you can't it's illegal to be at a gay bar in rome (laughs) and they go what and i go my man the pope lives here do you think this is legal for us to do (laughs) and it's one of the few times tyler and danny immediately know what i am doing they immediately are able to like it takes a lot for both of them to get in on it because they both sense an opportunity to prove that i'm wrong yes and it takes a lot of internal self-control not to immediately step on that and so you know obviously the service member freaks out for a second he tries to like get two of his boys and we're like i'm absolutely just joking with you we have run into a lot of americans it's it's 2023 it's totally legal (laughs) To be in a gay bar in (laughs) Italy right now. But it was great. It was so great. You gotta you gotta check people's (laughs) blood pressure every once in a while. Also, just kind of like a taste of like, you know, we're a small community on the outskirts of society. Welcome to being otherwise 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 for like one second. Otherwise. Thank you. Otherwise isn't what I... I know. You well, tried three welcome times. Welcome to being transitioned in a sentence. <laughs> welcome to being simplified for layman's terms. There it is. Otherwise known as... <laughs> there it is. There Best it is. of luck uh, editing this episode because... It's going to be hard. Yeah. Uh, I'll give it to Casey. Anyways, let's go ahead and now pause for a second and, and talk about... Break. Oh, yeah, we can do that too. I That'd need be to wonderful. change the battery and also I feel like we should refresh drinks. Oh, yeah, Absolutely. And we're back. Uh, we got to start also brainstorming ideas. Um, either here and queer, but that's a little too on the nose. So I actually mm. instead want uh, it to be out and, uh, out and about part one, never married. <laughs> I do like that. Um, Speculation. So we're halfway through the episode, or maybe two thirds of the way through. Kind of depends on how everything falls. Oh, What's the see. thing this story has been missing? A villain. You no, know, hetero, hetero, <laughs> heteronormativity has been there in all stories. I'm just going based off of the past, and every time you've asked me that. I just want you to remember, you said villain. I, the words I'm going to say, women. Uh, it has been missing women. We have covered four white, potentially gay dudes, two of whom were named James. Um, <laughs> That's fair. We have not covered any women yet. And there is a multitude of reasons for that. Yeah. Um, anyways... The the story has absolutely been missing women. It has. I also want to clock that it's been missing a bunch of other stuff. Yes. Like, for instance, the perspectives of indigenous people from multiple cultures, mm-hmm. from South Asian, East Asian, the African experience. I mean, even the experiences of Europeans. Right now I've been talking about the most wealthy and powerful men in Europe, and we're talking about yes. the average experience. This is a topic that is obviously broad enough that you could and people have written full doctoral theses on. Yeah. I'm trying to use some of the most common examples and anecdotes to help string together kind of a larger case study it's also like for the search of queer history. With historical figures and stuff, there's much more documentation about them right. in terms of history. And I'm sure there there's like small pieces of evidence from other like people in areas that aren't as like well aren't as notorious i guess like excuse me class real quick i just want to go ahead and draw everyone's attention to what maya just said i think (laughs) what maya just said is actually really interesting you're welcome for that that is (laughs) also the like i needed that (laughs) (laughs) it is also the first line of these notes essentially that 
what these people have in common mm-hmm. that I've covered so far. Yes, absolutely, 100% that they have been men, but also they have been people in positions of power. Yeah. And shocking no one, positions of power have largely been um, exclusive to wealthy men from a select group of families yes. for much of like European and American history. Mm-hmm. And so when we are basing our knowledge of history and observations about people, um, has to come from like notable figures of history. That wasn't a right. good way of saying yeah, that. Yeah, no. I'm sorry. No, I get it. I'm using historical records of famous people who were in power, and thus people were commenting on them and have more records. Right, mm-hmm. and there just were not a lot of women in power mm-hmm. who we have records about. And the women that were in power, those were at times such rare experiences that it was like, look at how she manages people, and like look at her court and things like that. Yeah, and they still talk about her sexuality, but it's in a much different way yeah. than powerful men are talked about. So I want to clock first and foremost that there obviously were successful gay women in history as well um, who ascended to positions of leadership or were notable in their field. Uh, One of the first Nobel Prize winners, for example, was secretly queer. Um, She had a bunch of love letters with her female wife and lover. I don't know if they used the word wife, but lived together forever. And so one aspect is that, so you have women who are in positions of power, but even when they are, the historical records that are written about them are exploring other aspects of their lives and identity because yeah. they're so rare in like that timeline of history. Yeah. But second, women just experienced different social pressures, different social expectations mm-hmm. throughout all of like yeah. American and European history as well. Like, for example, the old maid or the spinstress is yeah. much more of a feminine stereotype than yes. it is a male one. Yeah. Do you want to talk for a second about what the that like stereotype is of the old spinstress or like the old maid? Just like the older woman that's never been married or is like a widow. Right, exactly. Has no male to take care of. And what is usually one of the main reasons why society at the time at least viewed those women as unmarried? What was the cause of their spinster status? I don't know. They, Their apron was tied in the wrong place. Right. Or they were they were viewed as frumpy or mm-hmm. too outspoken, things like that. Yeah, they interrupt a lot. <laughs> like a lot. Says the woman who's They are really engaged. annoying and interrupt. <laughs> <laughs> but essentially that you have spinstresses who are unmarried women who their singlehood is allowed to be blamed on all sorts of different on things. On their own personhood. Correct. Not necessarily um, their sexual orientation. Which isn't to say that all spinsters were lesbians. That's certainly not true. <laughs> that is not what I'm saying. <laughs> be insane. It would be really <laughs> interesting. Um, but there is some evidence to suggest that in part because there were this writing narratives like, oh, she's alone because she doesn't look pretty, right? And she's like, yes, because I'm trying to get yeah, because butch women to like me. I look yes. hot to the women I am trying to or attract. I am a butch woman. <laughs> exactly. And then also with a patriarchal society like you find in Europe and America, women were maybe under less pressure to like have children and continue the family name. And so mm. maybe to a certain degree felt less pressure to get married and to hide their... Oh, that's true, yeah. Their personal lives. Women also in a lot of these societies, just by the structure of their societies, didn't live as public of a life as men because they weren't allowed to. Mm. And when you don't live as public of a life, you actually don't have to hide as much. That, yeah. like, there's a certain freedom in anonymity when it comes to all of this stuff, yeah. which is that, like, well, if no one's kind of paying attention to me. You Bye. Know. Exactly. And so it's not uncommon at all for there to be stories of spinsters who, oh, that's the spinster's cabin. Like, well, you know, the old elder women over there live in that cabin and never married and they've lived together for 40 here's, years. Here's what would have happened if I lived in this time. <laughs> I would either be a beard. I would either be the Anne of the story that was like, I'll bear your children and then you can go hang out with your right. really close male friend for some reason. <laughs> or I would be in the spinster cabin having a great time. I think we would honestly form such a power couple because I'd be like, listen, yes. I will <laughs> let you read whatever you want. <laughs> and when no it's time asked. to vote, I'll give you the ballot. 
<laughs> we need to produce one child. A single one. And keep at least one hot stable boy. And then other than that... And I get horses, exactly. you get a stable boy. It all wait, works oh, out. Wait, why is the tragedy of our lives that we were closeted gay people Damn 100 it. years ago? Because <laughs> I really do think that marriage of we convenience yeah. would have worked out. Worked out really well. I would think those were coyotes if we weren't in the middle of the city. Honey, I hear dogs out. Get your gun. <laughs> I'll get the stable boy and the children. <laughs> you stay there. Exactly. I'll hide the suffragette posters. <laughs> we would have had some amazing rallies. We honestly, let's write nonfiction for children. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> the bear and the beard. Big. Shut up. It writes itself. TM, 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 TM it's ours. ours. We approve copyright, it's ours. <laughs> bear and the beard. I'm We're going to make millions. <laughs> okay, so it's, um, you know, it's kind of like every cloud has its silver lining <laughs> in deep, oppressive, patriarchal, misogynistic, and sexist systems. Sometimes you got some freedom. A right, little bit. exactly. There's also, and you still see this stereotype today among yeah. the most toxic straight men mm. who cannot understand gay male homosexuality, but can totally get female homosexuality. Yeah, bro, that's Women are the high. good version. Exactly. Yeah. I like chicks, and I get why chicks like chicks, but you, why would anyone like guys? I'm full of self hatred. <laughs> right? Like, that's how that that's how that thought process works. I've been listening to this true crime podcast while I've been on my runs, and there's this... So it's an investigative journalist that's doing this whole thing, and he... While he's doing the investigative journalism, he's also getting the word out about this cold case, and eventually the cops... Someone comes forward, and the cops are able to make an arrest, like, while he's in the process of creating this podcast. Right. And so... After it comes out that one of the men has been arrested, he's interviewing people who knew this guy, and one of the guys that's interviewed is like, you know, it's like really confusing because because that guy was just like really quiet and honestly like kind of a coward. Like he's just not alpha enough to have commit this literal motherfucking murder. And I was like, never before have I taken a straight white man's opinion like this. <laughs> That's a valid reason for something. You're like, that's so toxic, but yeah, actually, don't yeah. think he has it in him. <laughs> Turns out, another man got arrested, and that was the alpha dude. I, so. That's so funny. It was pretty funny. That's so funny. Honestly, he's not beef like me, who definitely didn't murder him. And yeah. I was like, oh, Honestly, okay. like, I hated him, because he would never stand up for himself. And also, he's a coward. So, what? you have a couple of different competing forces at play here, right? You have yeah. societal... Um, sexism and misogyny that relegate women to kind of like lives in the shadows. Mm -hmm. And for people whose life wouldn't be accepted publicly, that shadow is actually kind of comfortable a little bit. Mm -hmm. You also have, you know, white patriarchal views are then bulldozing over the experiences of uh, men and women, people of color and indigenous experiences. Right. And we've talked in the past about our own country's history of destruction and genocide of indigenous people. This episode isn't specifically about that. Maybe I will do one in the future because yeah. it's too rich, I think, of a story to tell briefly in the footnotes of a now yes. two hour episode. <laughs> but I wanted to just kind of take a nod to that, that this isn't the only narrative yeah. of what's going on at the time. Um, and so the social movement. Did you hear that? I did. I, and it completely threw me off for a second. It sounded like a rocket. I know. I don't know if the microphone. What is oh, happening? It's outside. cars outside. <laughs> <laughs> um, so social equality and social progress starts to be made in the 1940s, 1950s. Uh, and you get like kind of first and second wave feminism who were mm -hmm. like, women should be allowed to own jobs and have Credit their cards. own name. No, that's not going to happen to the 70s, babes. Oh. But, you know, maybe, maybe women should be allowed to vote if they're going to make our tanks during the war. <laughs> <laughs> which they did. And this increased social equality um, empowers both gay men and gay women in America. First, by making society less rigidly patriarchal. Yeah. Not completely free, but just less of it. Mm -hmm. There's less expectation for American gay men to be like the leaders of their own households, right? That expectation is right. slowly fading away. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, uh, gay, lesbian, queer women um, who are the head of their own households are increasing increased like legal status 
status uh, within our own justice system. Right. And so you see movements like that in the 40s, in the 50s, in the 60s that correspond with a bunch of social movements around kind of freeing ourselves from social expectations at the time. Like the hippie movement, for example, yes. the free love movement, mm-hmm. the drugs, not hugs or whatever it was called. <laughs> <laughs> drugs, not hugs. Leave me alone, but hi, welcome. Uh, <laughs> the anti-war movement, yes, things yes, like yes, that. Yes, yes. Um, and you have Americans, especially American young people, flocking to the city and uh, starting to explore an identity defined not based off of like where they were or who they were immediately raised around, but the, their own chosen narrative. Who they want to become. Yeah. Exactly. This is also around the time that you start to get the first kind of openly gay, or at least openly acknowledged as gay, neighborhoods in America, right? Hollywood and Los Angeles, the Castro District in San Francisco, Boys Town in Chicago, these places where people are congr- I know. The Boys first Town? two were so nicely named, and the third one was like, and then Gay Whoville. <laughs> <laughs> Every time I say Boys Town and talking to our friends from Chicago, all I think of is Gay Whoville. <laughs> boys Town. <laughs> Find your boys in Boys Town. But there's that um, handy little law of nature. I think it's one of Newton's law. Uh, every reaction has an equal and opposite reaction, yeah. right? And so as all of these social boundaries get pushed, boundaries push back. Mm-hmm. And this is specifically tied now to the second red scare in America where like communism's going to take your children and turn them into socialists or whatever. Yes, it will. And so it's led by <laughs> at the time Senator McCarthy, Senator mm-hmm. from Wisconsin, yes. who leads the House Un-American Activities Committee just out here to find liberals, commies, homosexuals, people he doesn't like, yeah. your mom, like kind of like anyone <laughs> who he doesn't like like, um, and he's going to put them on trial for being un-American, for being That's communist. Fun. And one of the things the House Un-American Activity Committee does is manage to link communism with homosexuality. That essentially they push this narrative that anyone who's a communist, who believes in communism, or is affiliated with the American Communist Party, mm-hmm. has some kind of mental disorder. And ah. do you know what's considered a mental disorder in the 50s and 60s? Everything. Homo- yes, yeah. but homosexuality <laughs> mm-hmm. specifically. And so all gays are communists, and all communists are weird, and that makes <laughs> okay. that's fine. I can tell you for a fact, as a person who's gone on many disappointing dates, not all gays are communists. Not all gays are <laughs> even socially liberal. They are. There's a, there's a, there's a a lot of Republicans out there. Um, it's fun. All of this culminates in an event known as the Lavender Scare. Oh, are you familiar with the Lavender Scare? Was? It's tickling a brain cell. Okay, so <laughs> just one. Though. I'm going to introduce now a name you yes. are not ready to hear. Oh God, George Santos, Ju- Abraham Lincoln, <laughs> Julia Child. <laughs> <laughs> the the joy of French cooking with mm-hmm. Julia Child. Uh, if you watch the movie Julie and Julia, you actually yeah. see a moment of the lavender scare when Paul gets re- dragged back to Washington yeah. D.C. and is interrogated for hours about his affiliation and things like that. So what the Lavender Scare was, spurred on by anti-communist activists like Senator McCarthy, Mm -hmm. is they went through the federal government and essentially tried to find however many gay people they could find and then force them out of the federal government. Forcing gay people out of the federal government was an executive order handed down by President Eisenhower, president in the 1950s, and then pursued and sought after. And so you have gay people, at least gay people who are working for the federal government, immediately have to fall back into the shadows. Mm -hmm. And one of the really disappointing things about this episode is that by and large, the people who lost their jobs in the Lavender Scare are people who are working for like the State Department Mm -hmm. and other branches of the federal government who were patriotic enough for their country to want to be a civil servant for it, to help people access this country or to move freely, um, who helped operate the mechanism of what makes the federal government useful for us today. Passport services, things like that. And their government, who they dedicated their career towards, thanked them by outing them and forcing them out of the closet. There's a new movie that stars, or show that stars uh, Matt Boner. Mm -hmm. Um, I forget what it's called specifically. Time Travelers or something like that. Anyways, one of the things they focus on is the fact that they are federal workers who have to hide their sexuality in order not to lose their job. Oof. Yeah, yikes. And so that develops over time further into the federal policy of don't ask, don't tell, 
which was a military policy that was first approved by Clinton and then reversed under the Obama administration. So we're now getting into some very modern, recent yeah. and modern history. Um, don't Ask, Don't Tell was a military policy that said the military will not ask service members about their sexual orientation. Right. And in exchange, service members are expected then not to share their sexual orientation. Right. Um, but if they did, they could be dismissed from the U.S. Armed Forces. <laughs> Yikes. And so if you wanted a promotion and one of the guys you were going up against, you knew, Was, had a boyfriend. Mm, you could out them. You could out them. You could and you would. Or if your supervisor had it out against you, they could out mm. you. Or like, you know, you work with these people for long enough. You get comfortable with them. They know your life. Suddenly they pick up on a few, few clues and you've been outed. Don't ask, don't tell. While it was originally intended to protect gay service members. Ended up being like an attack mechanism. Correct. It ended up becoming a way of kind of blackmailing mm. U.S. service members. And it was one of the first things the Obama administration reversed in 2010. But it helps connect this much longer history of searching for gay and queer stories mm -hmm. that even in the 1990s i mean i'm alive yeah when don't ask don't tell is put into effect you have systems of power specifically being like go away disappear yeah, sh 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 stop acknowledging this part of your existence mm -hmm. it might not be the like physical murder discrimination yeah. that people experienced earlier and still experience in large parts of the yeah. world today but it's still a form of a, an aggression. Right. It yeah. was. It's an attempt to erase that part of you that existed up until 2010, mm -hmm. right? We're 14 years removed from the ending of that policy. My students who are freshmen now in That's high insane. school were born after that policy was enacted. So it's very recent history, and it's connected to this very long history, and it's what makes this topic and why it... Was such. I, mean, I feel like this has been a weird episode for me. I don't think weird in a bad way, but it hasn't been my traditional episode. Yeah. Because I feel like I'm ultimately trying to answer a question that I feel like even shouldn't need to be, be asked. Yeah. Right. But it's like, where are all the gay people in history? And like, why is it, one, so hard to find them? Mm -hmm. And two, why is it still considered so controversial to try to find them? And even in like ancient history too, though, it's like still not talked about when you take AP World History or whatever uh, classes about homosexuality and right. like the pirates and stuff and like ancient Rome and right. like all of the, where like homosexuality was not uncommon at all. It's still not something that we discuss exactly. for some reason. Did you see, it was this news report, either humpback whales or blue whales mm. were recorded mating in the ocean for one of the first times. Like, we were able to catch it on camera. Oh. And it was two male whales. <laughs> <laughs> That's the biggest, like, fuck you exactly. to science. <laughs> exactly. And so you now... Now, I mean, I'm not the only person trying to go back and find evidence and examples of this queer history. Yeah. One thing, and this is its own separate story, and it felt weird to talk about specific families who, like, oh, their cousin wrote an article for Huffington Post, and now Grant did, what, an hour and a half long episode on their family? Like, yeah. that's weird. But there are plenty of episodes now, or, sorry, stories now, of people going back and rediscovering gay relatives or gay family members yeah. that were either A, hidden from them completely, yeah. or B, their sexuality was hidden from them. Mm -hmm. Like the number of people my age and a little bit older who are learning, oh, my uncle died of AIDS. Yeah, that's crazy. Oh, my mom's uncle who never married and always had all these cool stories and I always had all these cool friends. He was gay and yeah. I was never acknowledged in our family, right? Or mm -hmm. like, what do you mean my dad has a brother? And why haven't I never met him yeah. before? There are a couple of really famous examples of this. Mm -hmm. um, Oral Roberts. There's Oral Roberts University. Oral Roberts was one of America's first popular TV evangelist. Mm. Um, his oldest son was was a documented uh, gay person yep. in Oklahoma. Died at the age of 38 when he was found in his car with bullets in his body. Ooh. Yeah. And his grandson went back through history and be like, oh, I had a, I had a great uncle, uncle yeah. who was gay and no one talks about it in this family that's insane especially with such like a probably high profile murder right that exactly you don't talk about that that's insane and then there's the netflix show and if you are looking for a feel-good show uh -huh. feel-good little documentary you gotta watch netflix's a secret love okay so it's these two older women 
in their 70s who have been roommates <gasps> for 50 years. And they were roommates. And they were roommates. <laughs> um, they met, one of them was a baseball player in a league of their own, uh, like the women's yeah. baseball league that was founded during the war. Um, they met through that. They moved in together. They like worked at the same office and stuff. And the documentary does such a cool job at exploring the efforts these two women had to take to hide their relationship. Um, they didn't come out to their families until this, they, were, they were 70. I'm sorry, and no one in their family was like, hey, so I know so, that like your roommate is your roommate, but like. It's been like <laughs> nine months at least since I've seen the episode. Yeah. But from what I remember, like a lot of the kids and grandkids, it was just like you know how when you're exposed to something super young, yeah. you never have like a critical eye towards it. Yeah, it was like there's Aunt Jean and, and her friend, her friend, who we just call Aunt Kim, and like Aunt Kim comes to like the holiday parties and like you know like you know how kids can't explain to you how your uncle in law is your uncle but yeah. is also your in law. It's yeah. just well, there's Gary, right? Yeah. Like, that's, like he's just around, right? Exactly. Yeah. I think for a lot of them, that's what it was, and, and they just never questioned it. No, yet. and they never shared it out loud, and they never like kissed or held hands or anything. And I think they both wow. kept separate bedrooms obviously they slept in the same room every but night they had a but they claimed separate bedrooms. bedrooms and then the documentary covers them kind of coming out to the family who's super supportive and then going to like nursing homes and they're like we're a couple so what do the couple things look like and living oh. out loud for the first time and it's very sweet and it's very touching but also at the same time it's heartbreaking because one of the things oh. they talk about is they were like we always tried to make sure that we didn't have too many gay friends or that we didn't go to too many gay parties. So which they, wasn't to say that they completely isolated themselves. But it was like they were trying not to be a part of that community. Correct. To come out, exactly. literally. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So, um, turns out part two was a lot shorter. Because I'm now kind of in like the last no, segment of things. Um, I think people who don't have an appreciation for how hard this history is defined, and then also to a certain degree, kind of how fraught with emotion and pain this history is, then don't understand why gay people in the gay community especially are so adamant about their representation in media today. Mm -hmm. So there is this concept known as like straight washing, yeah. which is if you have a historical character that's based off of a real person and you intentionally hide the gay components mm -hmm. of their identity, or if you have a movie or TV show based off of a book, and the book, the character is gay, and, and then the in the show, movie, yeah. they're just single as a Pringle, right? Like, mm -hmm. that is straight washing and is deeply frustrating and is done to make the material more marketable mm -hmm. but at the same time continues to emphasize that this is something that wouldn't be marketable if we didn't keep the gay thing a secret yeah. further that's not to say that they have to start off the show or movie with like a pride parade yeah but i also don't appreciate being treated as something that's like tv ma you know you also don't want to be like to it, it, there's a hard balance that i think a lot of authors are like trying to find right now of like not to Organizing, right. Like other characters, even if their main love interests, their main characters are straight and cisgendered, it's hard to to bring in a diverse cast right. of people. They're like, I think they've reached a, a solid point of like not otherizing like people of color or indigenous groups or anything like that. I think they are still struggling with that like other identity of like cisgender, transgender or uh, like other sexualities too right. without making it be like look at this friend my gay friend he's gay and we're all cool with it <laughs> right you know and it's a very strange <laughs> dichotomy <laughs> right and like how do you how do you show the life of a queer person that acknowledges their queerness without mm -hmm. being like and it was traumatic at one point right like yeah, how do you yes. like how do you write a gay character whose sexual orientation and identity helps fill in who they are, mm -hmm. but that doesn't require them to be the victim of a hate crime in chapter three for you to understand yes. that component of yeah. them. Yeah. Right. So that delicate balancing act is there and exists. And I think there's some really interesting conversations about mm -hmm. it. Speaking now personally, one of my own, Grant Thomas's frustration is when you finally do get a gay character mm -hmm. who is either the lead or a main supporting character in a TV show. Yeah. And like with love, it goes to a straight actor. And that's not to say there are not incredible straight actors out mm -hmm. there. But until about two seconds ago, those were really risky roles to have. Yeah. And, like, for instance, the actor who plays Will in Will and Grace, straight man. Yeah. Um, and then Jack McFarland, the mm -hmm. person who plays Jack McFarland, I'm forgetting his name right now. Yeah. Um, he's gay, but Jack McFarland is, like, this caricature, and Will is, like, this 
understandable, approachable, maybe a lot of times a little flouncy. Yeah. But like he's like the straight man and he's played by a straight man, even though the character himself is a gay character, yeah. right? Or like in Modern Family, you have Cam and Mitch mm-hmm. and Cam played by the wonderful Eric Stone Street, who does a wonderful job, is a straight man, is a straight actor. And so you have kind of within the last 10, 15 years, stories about gay people that are now being given to like straight actors. And it just felt like gay actors had to hide that portion of their identity. Um, they, If they did gay roles even 20 years ago, they got stereotyped into that margin of things. And now that it's somewhat profitable or, or like the general public's willing to consume it, now any actor will get it. And it's like, well, you couldn't have given queer actors like their that moment chance, with yeah. these stories. Like for instance, I know at least when it came out, I haven't been up to date with like every single element. The uh, actor who plays Simon in the Hulu series, Love Simon, mm. is heterosexual, or at least oh, yeah. was um, identifying that way when the show when the first show came, came out. out. Yeah, and it's like you couldn't have given that to a queer actor. Maybe they gave it to the who they thought was best, and I guess that's true too, right? Like being gay in and of itself doesn't make you the best actor for a role. Mm-hmm. I just feel, I think, more sensitive and connected to that history because yeah, yeah. of how long that's been shoved to the shadows that now that you are willing to tell our stories, you're not even casting us to tell them, right? And it mm-hmm. continues to take our own agency out of our ability to talk about our experiences. Yeah. I think where it gets this conversation gets kind of weird is because we have this conversation around people of color, right, as well, um, where, like, if you're going to have a character of color or a character that's not white, you should cast someone of that heritage. And then people get mad when there's a white character or a traditionally like straight character that then gets given to a gay actress or person of color. And then that becomes a weird dichotomy of like, yeah, but that's not the point because like at that point it's like I don't know what to say anymore because it's like it's like reparations in some sense because this person probably hasn't been given the same like opportunities as their like white straight counterparts right but then we're making the argument that people of color and people of different identities should be able to tell their own stories. But like, I absolutely agree that you should be able to see different aspects of different stories. Like there's no reason Ariel can't be black. Right. Also Ariel's a fictional character. So it was a bad example, but like, you know, it's like, it's like, I absolutely agree with you, but it's like a hard no, conversation to have because I don't know what to say. Right. Cause like, also what, I think a lot of these storytellers don't want identity to be the only, only part of the yeah. story that gets told. Yeah. Right. I think it's an interesting component. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think you and I are both English major girlies at heart <laughs> to a certain degree. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so yeah, there's yeah. a certain element of like, well, who's telling the story and what is that perspective? Mm-hmm. But that alone is not the whole story. And mm-hmm. you don't want to, you don't want to boil down your criticism or thoughts or reaction to a story yeah. on like that alone. Yeah. So heard. Yeah, it's a weird I also feel weird about it just cuz I like I think I realized I was bisexual like well into adulthood, right? Right? And probably like well after most people who are like queer who are like actually like fully gay one way or the other will realize it, right? And then I was also raised in an immigrant household to an Asian American. But so I never got that like feeling of like community and identity from the Japanese Americans, but I also never got that sense of identity from like my American counterparts. So I don't really feel that sense of like loyalty one way or another. And like I've started to kind of feel that with like Asian representation in stories like Everything Everywhere All at Once, like the uh, Turning Red TV show and like stuff that like actually emulates things that I kind of grew up with. But those are all Asian American experiences, not like Asian experiences, right? And so it's like hard to be like, like I don't understand why we can't give these different stories to different people, but like I absolutely understand now seeing like my face in some of these stories where I hadn't been able to relate to these characters before. And right. that probably like, I don't know, that was pretty sc- scatterbrained. No, I, I yeah. followed along. I don't know, maybe maybe it was to our listeners, but I mm-hmm. was dead ringer for you on there too because I mean, I've been pretty open about how mm-hmm. grateful I am for the connection I have with my family. Um, 
but for different reasons, I remember growing up feeling this like strange disconnect, right? Mm -hmm. Like we didn't know any gay people growing yeah. up. And even before I had the words to explain that part of my identity, yeah. I knew it wasn't something that I was supposed mm -hmm. to explain at the time. Now my family is incredibly open now. And I think like a lot of Americans have, have evolved a lot on the issue from the 90s, right? <laughs> but I remember feeling as a kid, really isolated by what I knew I wasn't supposed to talk about. And then secondly, remembering that like I wanted to be in a community where I saw myself on the street yeah. and that wasn't where I was being raised. And I remember dealing especially early in my, my early 20s feeling a lot of guilt for leaving a place where so many people loved me mm. for a thing that I was having like a hard a time defining. Right. right. Yeah, that's fair. Because I do still feel community in Nebraska. Yeah. But it's not maybe the community that I wanted to build my entire life around. Right, right, right. And I think there's still elements of me that feel selfish that mm -hmm. I have found it and have been so grateful for having yeah. found it. And my parents are super supportive. Yeah. My siblings are super supportive. They all joke about how much they love having a place to come out and visit. Yeah. And I think understand... Grant's but happy where he's at, and then he's yeah, yeah he's this that fish found his water, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that search for community, and I yeah. think that then also gets to why representation for communities of color who yeah. have been historically underrepresented in our media yeah. and marginalized is important. And I think that gets to the search for queer history. Yeah. So I'm going to kind of finish up yeah, at least some it. of the notes that I wrote here. This is now straight from Grant, so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I think ultimately a lot of these historical people would not want to be only defined by their sexuality. Mm -hmm. James Buchanan, for better or worse, shaped the direction of the Democratic Party. Richard the Lionheart was famous mostly for the battles he won. And his heart that was literally a lion. A lion, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> he stole it and put and it in. And for his like, weird sleeping tendencies. <laughs> <laughs> um, King James the first and sixth, you know, reigned over like a relatively peaceful and successful period of time and was the first joint ruler of mm -hmm. um, uh, Scotland and England. And then you have people like Lord Byron who um, <laughs> somehow have, right, have so much to their legacy that their sexual orientation or identity doesn't feel like it should be the top of the resume. Yeah. And then say the Russian author's name for me. Tchaikovsky. Thank you. Who wrote all too. those wonderful ballets. Yeah. Even that person who is very open in his private life probably does not want that as their identity yeah. solely. Yeah. That, that's not what gets top building. Yeah. They wouldn't want to be defined by that. They are great people of history for a reason. But modern gay people are regularly called upon to justify our existence. That prove that we aren't just misguided or in a phase. That our experiences are valid. And that pointing out that our experience is just as old as heterosexuality is an obvious way to justify our place in this world. And we don't see attaching the gay label to these historical figures as a degradation of their memory. Straight people oftentimes are the ones who do. Mm -hmm. And that is homophobia, which actually isn't our problem to fix. Mm -hmm. It's victimized us enough already, and there's no reason to pretend there weren't powerful gay people in the past, at least from our own perspective. Even further, I think the fact that gay history, either intentionally or maliciously or otherwise, used it right this time, <laughs> is so shrouded in mystery, adds further fuel to the fire that to be queer means to invent a life and a future for yourself that the outside world has not provided for you. And that's freeing, but also a really hard form to follow. How do you draw when there aren't any lines to watch? Mm -hmm. I remember feeling that a lot as a kid. And I still yeah. feel it now. That's one last thing. But I still feel it now. Where it's like, what's the rubric that I use? Mm -hmm. Not only about like, am I doing life right? But have I developed into a good person? Mm -hmm. Right? Like, am I, what does active in my community look like if I'm not volunteering in a PTA organization? Mm -hmm. Right? What does having community look like if I'm not talking to people at like a youth soccer league? <laughs> things like that. You yeah. know? That for better or worse you are outside of the social norm mm -hmm. and you're just kind of swimming, right? And finding Nemo, you've left the reef and you're trying to touch the butt. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, I thought that was clever too. Um, and then that gets me to this final thing, which is still, is this hidden gay life, is the shadows that m so many gay people have been forced to live in, ultimately like a gift? Is art best created when you're outside of the current? Is it that pained, isolated perspective 
that makes art powerful in the first place. Certainly, gay people have, for centuries, been drawn to communities and people that were safest for them, creating freer, more open environments to challenge the status quo and revel in the exploration of the human soul. Some of that stuff is queer-focused, and some of it is a bit more mainstreamed. Okay, and then I wrote, this is more boring, and then I stopped writing. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I should, have, I should have cut it off one sentence sooner, <laughs> but that's okay, no. I'm human. Yeah, I feel like it's also heartening to remember that there are people as far back as, like, Richard the Lionhearted or Cleopatra or Elizabeth I that, right. like, were others yeah right like whether they're women in places that women haven't traditionally been or they were queer in places that queer people haven't traditionally been and they they did something right like we're talking about them now they they made their some kind of a mark on history right whether it was by their lineage or by their actions or whatever and that's like that's like a little sure. glimmer of hope whether like well, and it's like, how many really interesting people have we talked about on this podcast whose lives started off one of two ways, mm -hmm. either very different from other people at the time yeah. or just s stocked with tragedy, <laughs> yes. right? Like I think of like people as different as like Britney Spears. That's a different childhood than what your average 14 year old's having. Yes. And Mary Shelley. Yeah. Also not the average mm -hmm. childhood that a 14 year old is having, no, yeah. right? And both of them, can't believe I'm using Britney Spears and Mary Shelley in the same sentence. <laughs> But yes, I can. It's an episode on gay history. <laughs> um, and like, how did those sh how did those shape their experiences? And both of them are absolutely artists in their own ways. I yeah. mean, even Sylvester Graham like failed for much of his life. Same with John Brown. And how yeah. did those initial tragedies and shortcomings and being on the outside looking in yeah. end up shaping what would become their life's work? That is really cool. Yeah. Thank you. This, yeah. I hope at the end of the day, I get a, this topic justice at all. Yeah. I feel like it was very scatterbrained. I feel Listen like it, it resonated, even though I don't necessarily like 100% identify with like the queer community. It resonated with like all of the ways that I feel other mm. in other ways. Mm -hmm. And like whatever I feel right now, there has been someone in the past that has right. felt other in the same way as me. And they've made it somehow there's, there's this right? saying and it was like there actually isn't an experience left that you could experience sorry mm -hmm. there's not an emotion left that you could experience that someone else has that a song it. hasn't actually been written about already there it is that's it it might not be in the language you speak <laughs> yeah but if your heart is feeling a kind of way mm -hmm. someone who was more mu musically inclined than you mm -hmm. are put it to music and talked you know, about it you know one of my favorite quotes about Carly depression Carly Rae Jepsen sorry go ahead uh, yes <laughs> <laughs> one of my favorite quotes is like you know if you're struggling with depression and you're alive. Technically, depression is struggling with you. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Have you also heard um, why humans might have evolved depression? No. Have you not heard this? No. Saying right now, saying right now. This was a TikTok that I thought was funny and I saw a follow-up TikTok on. I did not then go and find the Bradley scholarly Morgan. article. <laughs> Bradley Morgan! <laughs> it turns out when you accidentally just kind of like side quote Brandon Lee Mulligan, <laughs> you gotta say his full name or they will come for you. Um, and it was, depressed people are better at predicting the future. Yes. <laughs> it was like, it hasn't rained in a week, the crops are gonna fail. <laughs> Turns out those people are better at making plans for in that moment for when the crops fail than the, I think it's all going to turn around tomorrow. People like me starved until people like you were like, we better get some berries. These crops are not going to grow. <laughs> Depression and anxiety? <laughs> I like to equation for success. I like to think I like to think it has just been the bear in the beard in every historical situation where you go, the crops are gonna fail. Someone needs to get berries, and then you laid down, and I was like, better go find some berries. La, la, I said la, to la, go la. find some berries. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That depressed people are better at like forecasting, if not the future, potential tragedies of the future. Yeah. And that has had some evolutionary benefit because it's helped us avoid the worst of it. And that is why that genetic <laughs> trait stays around. Fuck. <laughs> Here I was hoping I was not evolutionarily stable. I hate to say it, but you might actually be the secret to our continued existence. No. <laughs> 
Just kidding. I wrap it all around with ADHD so I forget to eat. I think this is actually a really beautiful metaphor to end on because I think this whole episode has been like, search for meaning, search for purpose, search for place. Yeah. Who are we? Why are we here? What led us here? And I think that's respective of like some of our individual yeah. identities. Um, Ultimately, your identity doesn't super matter in the terms of who you want to be. Right. right? Like, yes, it will affect your experience and your, I don't know, perception of the world around you, but it's not, it shouldn't be your defining characteristic. Or it doesn't have to be if you don't want it, it to doesn't, be. Yeah, you know? it can be. If right, you want 100%. It to be. Yeah. Lord knows what has happened to you. So, like, you know, move through the spaces as you need to. Slams door, turns on karaoke machine. <laughs> gimme, gimme, gimme a man after me. James would be fine. He has a tunnel to his boyfriend's room. <laughs> he acts like we don't know it, but he does. We, we do. all know it. We you hear know. the music from both ends. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and so. Yes, uh, the this whole episode has been the search for gay history, but that title is too long for this. Search for gay. <laughs> <laughs> Out and about part one, finding him. Aww. <laughs> oh, is that actually a maybe? That I still cute. like never married as a title. Never married, I think, is funny. <laughs> um. So this is this is that's it. That's eccentric. It. Eccentric. Eccentric uncle. <laughs> Do no. we just put out and about part one, Gunkle? <laughs> That's short for you. <laughs> that is short. I think um, I like Never Married. Any uh, any final closing thoughts? I feel like we've been in the closing thought said, things for a while. I've said my closing thoughts. This has I been think. good. I think, again, I'm sorry if you have liked the really linear, and then three days later, this happened. If you like that, re-listen to Agatha Christie. I give listen you a day by day. Episodes. Yes, listen to my <laughs> episodes. I'm Most like, what's the, the one I did about that? <laughs> Agatha Christie. Uh, this was much more of an exploration of a concept mm-hmm. and two friends relating to maybe a little bit too hard to it. Yeah. And launching a book deal, so stay tuned. Yeah, right book. in with subplot ideas. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel like what we need to do, what we need to do yes. is when we announce the theme for the following week, we need to come up with, maybe we need to come up with the theme earlier so that we can ask our listeners for stories relating to that theme mm. and that way we can do like listener episodes listener episodes hells yeah we just need to figure out a way to and then separately in the summer when i have loads of free time we launch our first side podcast which is audiobooks for the beard and the bear <laughs> is it the beard and the bear or the bear to, bear and the beard <laughs> A we can do there. the beard and the bear. The beard and the bear, the bear and the beard, the beard and the bear, the bear and the beard. They all sound the same. When I teach my kids that tongue twister, <laughs> that's August. <laughs> it's a tough one. <laughs> the D comes before. Um, what does the D come before, Maya? All right, well, as she answers that question, it's been a pleasure hanging out with you today or this evening. Um, you can find us anywhere you get your podcast. If you would like to see us in video form, you can find us on YouTube at Well I Laughed. We're also on basically every social media at Well I Laughed. For additional content, we are Well I Laughed Podcast on Patreon. <laughs> and if you have thoughts, feelings, keep them to yourself. No, I'm kidding. Just kidding. Please write in. Let us know. And you can write in at Well I Laughed Pod <laughs> at gmail.com. What's the D come after, Maya? I don't know. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs>